Caros é, ouvintes, é, caros colegas, professora Dilson, professor Castor e, e especialmente o professor Hernan, uma boa noite. É, sejam, então, bem-vindos a esse nosso quinto encontro, é o último dia de atividades do, desse nosso congresso que reuniu especialistas é, brasileiros e especialistas é, internacionais. É, nesse congresso intitulado Filosofia em Tempos e Pandemia. Antes de eu passar a palavra ao professor Adilson, ao professor Hernan, eu vou fazer uma rápida retomada das atividades que foram realizadas ao longo desses, é, desses dias, então. Uh, nós iniciamos o nosso congresso uh, com a fala do professor Marcelo, nos uh, fazendo uma reflexão sobre o tema Filosofia em Tempos de Pandemia, a seguir, uma breve exposição sobre hermenêuticas e perspectivas em tempo de pandemia que eu apresentei e tivemos uma mesa redonda sobre a seguinte temática, os princípios e normas da ética em pesquisa deveriam ser relaxados durante a pandemia de Covid-19? E estiveram presentes, então, nessa mesa e nesse debate, o professor Darley Dallagnol, o professor Alcino, Alcino, o professor Eros Moreira, professor doutor Gabriel, eh, professor doutor Marco de Azevedo. Eh, e na segunda noite, nós tivemos uh, duas conferências, uma com o professor Castor Ruiz, a pandemia e as falácias do homo econômicos, um debatedor, então, Evandro Pontel, da PUC, e a conferência do professor doutor Roque Unes, pandemia do Covid-19 e crise ambiental, questões eh, críticas. Debatedora, doutora Rafaela Schaeffer. Uh, no dia 10 de junho, quarta-feira passada, tivemos uma, uh, uma mesa redonda e com duas conferências, uh, conferências. Simpatia e condições de escassez, reum visita ao Brasil durante a pandemia Covid-19, professor Evandro Barbosa, da Federal de Pelotas, e o debatedor foi o professor Denis Coitinho. E a conferência a, do professor doutor Denis Coitinho, pandemia e linguagem das virtudes, e o debatedor foi Evandro Barbosa. É, ontem à noite nós tivemos uma... A mesa redonda também, com duas uh, palestras ou duas conferências principais, com o Flávio Kapsinski, da McMaster University, eh, e a Flávia a Fernanda, Ser, a Fer, a, desculpa, Fernanda Serralta, da Unicinos, eh, com a mesma temática, saúde mental na pandemia Covid-19. Os debatedores foram a professora Clarice Mosman, da Unicinos, e o professor Marco de Azevedo, da Unicinos. E é com muita alegria, então, que nós iniciamos essa atividade de hoje à noite, que está dividida em dois momentos. O primeiro momento é um momento é, que vai ser conduzido, então, pelo professor Adilson uh, Feiler, que é professor do PPG é, Filosofia da Unicinos, é, com a temática Nietzsche e a dança rítmica para a grande saúde. E temos a alegria, então, de ter presente nessa vamos dizer, nessa mesa, como debatedor, o professor Hernan Guerreiro Troncoso, uh, da Universidade, é, da Universidade, deixa eu só ver, Católica é, de Maule. É, então, dito isso, eu, um, eu tenho a alegria, então, de passar a palavra ao professor uh, Adilson para conduzir, então, as, as tarefas e os trabalhos de hoje à noite, desejando, então, a todos uma, uma ótima noite de trabalho, de discussão, uh, nesse tempo de pandemia no qual estamos todos envolvidos e lembrando a discussão de ontem à noite, ou seja, a filosofia nasceu há 2.500 anos e ela, ela foi uma proposta de a gente pensar e trabalhar com a realidade do ponto de vista argumentativo, racional, é, para além de dogmas, para além de crenças que são é, circunscritas a, a, a dimensões, por vezes, ideológicas. É, e é nesse espírito, então, de debate, de discussão, que nós damos continuidade ao nosso trabalho. E aos nossos ouvintes, eu, uma, uma lembrança apenas, é, no ícone é, perguntas e respostas do evento, vocês têm um, um link, é, nesse link todos aqueles é, participantes podem é, acessar esse link e preencher 
uh, de modo a garantir, então, a presença no, no evento e também a certificação de participação nesse evento. Então, dito isso, com alegria, passo as, a, a palavra, então, ao professor Adilson Feiler e ao professor Hernan. Por favor, Adilson. Boa noite. Muito obrigado, professor Luiz, eh, pelas palavras tão gentis e a apresentação. E também, ao mesmo tempo, agradeço pelo convite que me foi feito a fazer parte deste evento. Ao mesmo tempo, quero é, agradecer, além do professor Luiz, também aos professores Castor e Marco, pelo, pela organização né, e brilhante também iniciativa de realizar este evento durante esse período que requer de nós, em termos de filosofia, darmos também uma resposta a esse contexto atual em que vivemos. E nesse intuito, então, eu tomo a liberdade de partilhar um recorte de minha pesquisa a respeito de uma possibilidade de superação que, eh, na filosofia de Nietzsche, nós podemos encontrar. Por isso, como título, ele já enseja isto, Nietzsche, a dança rítmica para a grande saúde, como opor resistência para a superação em tempos de pandemia. E Nietzsche deu sempre muita importância a grandes eventos que permearam a cultura, permearam as sociedades. E esses grandes eventos, eles marcam a humanidade e constituem etapas importantes do ciclo do retorno. E cada etapa alavanca o jogo marcado pela oposição e resistência de onde surgem, surgem as forças promotoras de vida. A humanidade hoje vive, pela pandemia, um novo ciclo do retorno. Como esse grande evento poderia servir como mais um antídoto redentor da humanidade em consonância a uma dança rítmica que alavanca a grande saúde? Diante desse gigantesco evento pandêmico, a humanidade sofre um ataque frontal incendindo agressivamente contra as suas frágeis seguranças. Qual o evento cortante, um vento cortante, uma caminhada invernal, um cume íngreme? A pandemia abala a vida em todas as suas dimensões, seja a dimensão biológica como a dimensão política, econômica, social e espiritual. A vida compreendida organicamente sofre falência em sua capacidade de respiração já que todos os poros pelos quais o ar é comunicado passam a sofrer obstrução. Com isso, a força é neutralizada, pois não há fruição para a recepção da vitalidade, nem descarga para que a força interna se externalize como criação. Politicamente, a vida sofre com a pandemia um ataque em sua estrutura gerencial, pois não se investe em uma cultura global, e sim na loucura política nacional, ou seja, um Estado que, ao invés de pensar é, em, na dinâmica do engrandecimento, do fortalecimento, ele passa a pensar só em si, deixando de lado a cultura, uma cultura que favoreça a força, como consequência desse Estado autocentrado, de um autoritarismo decadente, esse grande evento pandêmico ocasiona empobrecimento, já que as forças criadoras são inibidas e, com isso, sem produção não há riquezas, cuja falta venha se fazer sentir de maneira especial sobre a cultura. O ataque pandêmico afeta a vida em sua dimensão social, já que a prática do isolamento é sentido como solidão e esta última como fuga da realidade. Mesmo que compulsório, o isolamento social poderia servir como desencadeamento do grande encontro consigo mesmo, pela capacidade de autoafirmação. Esta impossibilidade do esforço de afirmação de si mesmo pela pandemia implica, por fim, no esvaziamento espiritual e consequente negação na formação de espíritos livres, aqueles que seriam capazes de se superarem enquanto tipos psicológicos afirmativos. 
Diante de todos os efeitos que a pandemia traz para a vida, ameaçando a nossa capacidade de afirmação e criação, somos levados a investir nos meandros da fisiologia de Nietzsche para nela encontrar pistas que nos auxiliem a pensar formas concretas de superação. Apresentamos, assim, então, um itinerário que se dá em três momentos, três movimentos. Primeiro, nós vamos refletir sobre o sentido que as forças ocupam no pensamento Nietzscheano. Forças que são o resultado do jogo entre oposição e resistência. E como pelo cultivo dessas forças se institua um antídoto capaz de superar a doença para alcançar a saúde. Intitulamos, portanto, esse movimento, a fisiologia da força, como superação da doença. Na sequência, nós vamos adentrar na teoria nitiana das forças para mostrar que pela afirmação da luta, o que implica em sofrimento, queda e caos, se é capaz de alcançar a saúde. E nós intitulamos esse movimento da queda à elevação, a genealogia da grande saúde. E, finalmente, nós vamos mostrar que a afirmação da vida pela afirmação da grande saúde é governada por ciclos eternos do retorno que perfazem a leveza de uma dança rítmica. Desse modo, todos os grandes eventos vividos o serão novamente em um número interminável de vezes. Logo, a afirmação da vida pela superação das oposições se dá pela docilidade a cada grande evento do retorno o vivendo em plenitude, não com amargura diante do peso mais pesado, mas com júbilo e dança, tornando assim a gravidade do grande peso leve e afirmação. Contudo, esse rompimento do peso e leveza só é possível a partir do rompimento do rebanho e o cultivo da solidão. Não uma solidão apática e acéfala, mas cultivadora de si mesmo, portanto, criadora. Intitulamos, portanto, esse movimento a afirmação do ciclo do retorno como redenção. Durante todo esse itinerário, nós vamos apresentar alguns elementos centrais da concepção nitiana das forças a fim de compor um cenário que possibilite responder os desafios atinentes ao contexto da pandemia. Passamos, então, imediatamente ao primeiro movimento desse discurso que tem como título a fisiologia da força como superação da doença. E aqui eu tomo a liberdade de apresentar um aforismo de Nietzsche que se depreende da genealogia da moral, a segunda dissertação, o aforismo 24. Diz aqui o Nietzsche, seria preciso uma outra espécie de espíritos, diferentes, aqueles, daqueles prováveis desse tempo, espíritos fortalecidos por guerras e vitórias, para os quais a conquista, o perigo e a dor se tornaram até mesmo necessidade, própria de uma grande saúde. Seria preciso, em suma, essa grande saúde. Ele virá o homem redentor do grande amor e do grande desprezo, o Espírito Criador, cuja força e impulsor afastará sempre toda a transcendência e toda a insignificância. Fim de citação. A filosofia inteira de Nietzsche ela consiste numa concepção de forças. Forças essas que a todo instante buscam assenhorar-se, afirmando-se frente às demais, num jogo eterno de luta. E é dessa luta que a vida poderia ser sustentada. Assim, enquanto houver força, a vida. Caso contrário, a morte e na nissa. Interessante notar que qual o contexto em que Nietzsche apresenta essas concepções de força, que é um contexto de fraquezas, doença degenerescência fisiológica, o que implica em decadência cultural. O próprio exercício do filosofar é apresentado pelo filósofo como uma forma concreta de manifestação de força contra a fraqueza, que já remonta ao pensamento de filósofos da antiguidade, como o de Sócrates, para quem, segundo ele, cabe a cada um ser mestre da sabedoria. Todo cuidado que se deve prestar com a saúde física se revela como um exercício próprio daqueles que se demonstram sábios diante desse quadro de pandemia degenerescente em que a força se anula, o filósofo alemão é impulsionado a apresentar o um movimento de elevação dessas forças, que é a condição necessária para a afirmação da vida. Nesse sentido, em se tratando da realidade da potenciação das forças, 
A dimensão fisiológica é o elemento central da filosofia de Nietzsche. Numa concepção fisiológica organicista como a de Nietzsche, o grande obstáculo a ser enfrentado reside na insistência de se instaurar pressupostos próprios e modelos filosóficos metafísicos. Contudo, é curioso o fato de como se pode refletir filosoficamente, afastando-se de todo e qualquer pressuposto. No caso de Nietzsche, talvez o único pressuposto possível é de que a realidade, que o movimento, caracterizado pelo jogo entre oposição e resistência, permeia a vida em sua totalidade. Por isso, a cada instante, novos desafios se desenham, fazendo com que um quanto de resistência se desprenda num processo sucessível e infindável. A configuração das forças que se depreendem desse sucesso, dessa sucessiva luta se dá em forma hierárquica, em subjugados e subjugadores. Contudo, os que hoje são subjugados amanhã poderão não ser, e vice-versa. A ordem é buscar continuamente o assenhoramento, pelo atingir de pontos sempre mais culminantes de potência, e enquanto houver obstáculos a serem superados, haverá necessidade de se opor resistência. Portanto, a força num processo que é infindável. Caso contrário, sem obstáculos, não há resistência e constantemente não há força. Em última análise, é a força o que move a vida e o que a sustenta. Vida é força. Por essa razão, a vida é mantida com as forças que lhe correspondem, na medida em que for imune à doença e gozar da saúde. Por mais paradoxal que possa parecer, para que a saúde seja uma realidade viável, é preciso que toda sorte de dificuldades, como o caminho íngremes, gelo, ar cortante e invernal, sejam experimentados em sua mais pura integralidade. Dessa experiência, um conjunto de anticorpos são ativados para a manutenção da vida em sua forma saudável. Pelo contrário, quando tudo se respira paz, harmonia e tranquilidade, não se tem como ativar esses anticorpos, pois nenhuma oposição é experimentada. O resultado disso não é outro senão o comodismo, desistência de lutar, conformismo, passividade e cansaço da vida. Ora, quando se cansa da vida, nenhuma perspectiva mais é possível. As forças se estagnam e todo e qualquer desejo ou vontade são inibidos. Nietzsche viveu grandes eventos de estagnação das forças, pelo excesso de confiança na razão moderna. O substantivo, o substitutivo, melhor dizendo, da fé cristã, ou seja, a versão ateia da religião. Quando a causalidade é, racional se arroga o direito a explicar todos os fenômenos, tudo se mecaniza e, consequentemente, as forças anímicas são suprimidas. Portanto, esse grande evento de decadência das forças traz como consequência necessária um descrédito em si mesmo e suas disposições orgânicas e fisiológicas para colocá-los em um governo da razão tecnocientífica, a fé na ciência. Esse fenômeno, o filósofo alemão constatou em todo o seu território nacional, que o incitou a toda a sua luta contra a modernidade, como responsável por todo esse movimento decadencial. Uma decadência física que se faz sentir numa decadência cultural. As consequências decadenciais que agora se vive pela pandemia perpassam a fisiologia em marcas, com marcas na cultura. Ou seja, a doença gerada pela pandemia cria incerteza, desânimo, sentimento de incapacidade, sintomas típicos da estagnação das forças quando, pelo contrário, poderia atuar como estimulante, promotor das forças, daquele jogo marcado pela oposição e resistência. Para tanto, o diferencial está na forma, na disposição com que se coloca de, diante desse fato. E, se for de maneira resignada, a força se esvai e a doença impera. Se for de maneira afirmativa, a força se estabelece e a saúde se eleva e se afirma. Logo, a saúde pode ser grande e efetiva na medida em que o fato é acolhido e afirmado. Não qualquer fato, mas o fato mais duro e desafiador. Em que medida, então, essa vivência da fraqueza fisiológica, da força e da enfermidade, como elementos que se compõem o fato, são capazes de estimular as forças que, para se gozar 
de uma grande saúde? E com essa pergunta, então, eu entro no segundo movimento deste discurso, intitulado da queda à elevação, a genealogia da grande saúde. A saúde, aqui eu começo com uma carta de Nietzsche à sua mãe, datada de 25 de junho de 1887. E ele diz aqui, entre outras coisas nesta carta, a saúde me parece cada vez menor e vai, assim, lentamente diminuindo. Um dos grandes obstáculos que Nietzsche teve que enfrentar a maior parte de sua vida foi com sua saúde. Desde muito jovem, talvez quando a partir de uma queda de cavalo sofrida durante seu período de serviço militar, passou a continuamente sofrer de inúmeras penas. A enfermidade sofrida pelo filósofo alemão se manifestou através de fortes dores no estômago, de dores de cabeça e enxaquecas, dificuldades na visão, náuseas e indisposições. Tudo isso por dias e até semanas. Testemunho disso são suas inúmeras correspondências relatando seu estado de saúde, como esta mediante a qual nós iniciamos esse discurso. Nietzsche sente que sua saúde física vai diminuindo pouco a pouco. Diante disso, vai seguindo adiante, contudo, tendo que se adaptar a ambientes que lhe sejam favoráveis, como testemunha sua contínua mudança de endereço, procurando um ambiente e um clima que se adapte à sua frágil saúde, bem como também à sua aposentadoria compulsória do cargo de professor na Universidade de Basileia. Não raro, tal como testemunha seu longo epistolário, o filósofo teve que interromper seus textos para poder se aliviar de suas terríveis dores as mais variadas possíveis. Curiosamente, à medida em que se a saúde diminui e a enfermidade aumenta, tal como testemunha pelo fragmento de sua carta à mãe, é, no ano de 1887, o ano também no início da redação de sua obra-prima para a genealogia da moral. Tanto mais parece que o filósofo vai também avançando em profundidade em sua reflexão, paradoxalmente. Assim, se por um lado o filósofo tem sua saúde fisiológica cada vez mais abalada, por outro, cada vez mais cresce em saúde produtiva. Ou seja, a doença parece ativar a sua capacidade produtiva. As duras penas que o filósofo de Naumburg tem que enfrentar, náuseas, insônias, como resultado de dores terríveis, alavancam uma saúde de pensamento, de clara evidência, profundidade e perspicácia em suas análises. A sua grande doença lhe desencadeia uma grande saúde. Dá a impressão que quanto mais Nietzsche sofre fisiologicamente, tanto mais produz filosoficamente. A cada queda que sofre como resultado de sua enfermidade sucede um regimento em termos de saúde de pensamento. Em outras palavras, o que há em Nietzsche está diretamente associado à experiência da dor e do sofrimento. Quanto mais ele sofre oposições oriundas de sua debilidade fisiológica, tanto mais goza de resistência oriunda de sua força de superação em termos de pensamento. E é justamente em 1887 com o um contínuo agravamento de seu quadro de saúde, que Nietzsche vai estabelecer as bases que orientam a origem e o princípio de todas as concepções morais, o grande mal e doença da cultura. A experiência interna, com suas inúmeras dores, alavanca a potência, a sua capacidade de enxergar a origem da moral e como ela atua na vida, degenerando-a. O próprio filósofo testemunha nesse seu escrito que é condição necessária para a grande saúde o um mergulho no caos pelo enfrentamento, mediante a colhida jubilosa da grande dor, pena e sofrimento, interpondo assim uma carga redobrada de resistência. Tal como Nietzsche vive toda essa pena de maneira individual, e seja assim em seus escritos a cada um assumir o peso mais pesado, que é condição necessária para a sua superação. Assim, todo o sentimento de desprezo, de dor, de pena, de angústia, alavanca o desejo, a vontade do grande sim, da afirmação, como um estado pleno e culminante que penetra todas as vísceras, as veias e poros, insuflando assim o ar do grande meio-dia. Nietzsche concebe a diminuição da saúde como desejo de aumento da mesma. Portanto, quanto menor a força fisiológica, 
que padece dor maior a força da vontade que quer e deseja, que é o desejo de saúde. Mas não qualquer saúde, e sim a grande saúde. Aquela capaz de realizar a redenção, pela superação de tudo que interpõe obstáculos e dificuldades. Com essa experiência pessoal, Nietzsche identifica a importância que ocupa o desfazer, ou melhor dizendo, o desprazer, a dor e a aprovação no contexto das forças propulsoras de uma grande saúde. Não que essa experiência de privação deva ser elegida como algo que se busque, ao modo pregado pela tradição ascética, mas como algo com o qual, sem que se busque, simplesmente se apresenta diante de cada um. É um fato. Nesse apresentar-se do sofrimento como algo, cabe, como um fato, cabe o grande sim pelo exercício da afirmação. Por isso, se afirma aquilo que se experimenta, se experimenta espontaneamente, como um fato natural próprio do destino, uma experiência que faz a dureza de sua oposição um gesto de afirmação, pela capacidade de resistência. Pois é desta mesma experiência que surgem unicamente os fortes, os vitoriosos, aqueles que foram conduzidos à busca do abismo. Foi assim que nos diferentes grandes ciclos do retorno vivido pela humanidade, que diferentes espécies pereceram e outras resistiram. As inúmeras catástrofes que o mundo já viveu, guerras, pandemias, fome, seca, testemunham que houve sobrevive... houveram sobreviventes. Os que jamais sucumbiram à oposição, mas interpuseram resistência. São aqueles espíritos graves, fortes, livres, que souberam acolher e afirmar o grande peso mediante o seu gesto de leveza de uma dança rítmica. Em que medida, portanto, é possível afirmar que cada ciclo do retorno, como aquilo que de mais pesado e insuportável carrega? E aqui, então, passamos ao terceiro e último movimento desse discurso, que tem como título a afirmação do ciclo do retorno como redenção. E aqui eu tomo a liberdade de iniciar a partir de um aforismo de Nietzsche que se depreende dos seus fragmentos póstumos de outubro de 1888. Diz aqui Nietzsche, a arte vale aqui como única, como contra-força considerada contra a vontade de negação da vida. Ela é a redenção do ajustado. Ela é a redenção do doente, como o caminho para situações onde o sofrimento será querido, transfigurado, divinizado, onde o sofrimento é uma forma de grande encanto. Fim de citação. Nietzsche tem no eterno retorno do mesmo a sua grande doutrina, ou como ele mesmo afirma, o seu pensamento abissal. Por essa doutrina, o filósofo alemão chancela todo o seu pensamento afirmativo de tudo o que vivemos e o tornaremos a viver e ainda mais, desejaremos viver novamente um interminável número de vezes. Com isso, Nietzsche mostra que não se trata de revivermos somente eventos prazerosos, mas também eventos marcados pelo peso do desprazer, da dor e do sofrimento. Ademais, esses não constituem eventos pequenos isolados, mas constituem em seu todo eventos grandes, marcantes. Muitos desses, inclusive, a humanidade já viveu e assim o viverá inúmeras vezes. Por mais espantoso que possa parecer, Nietzsche pretende, com essa mega doutrina, mostrar qual deverá ser a disposição do espírito daqueles que se deparam com o fato, os mais desafiadores. À medida de uma disposição afirmativa marcada do quantum de força e energia criativa que cada um dispõe para superar-se, a superação demanda disposição afirmativa, encarar com ânimo proativo, constância e otimismo mega-eventos, Situações, rochas aparentemente intransponíveis. É somente munido da carga da força que se poderá exercer a nobre missão de redimir tudo o que se apresenta como negação da vida. Tudo o que representa fraqueza e desânimo. Tudo o que se julga conhecido, determinado, ajustado, divinizado. Tudo o que se encontra enfermo, decadente. A contra-força, contra toda a força que conduz para baixo, Contra todo o movimento de conformação passiva, é a força que demanda do sofrimento encarado como disposição afirmativa. É a capacidade de opor resistência contra tudo o que se impõe ou se pretende impor como a última palavra. Diante de quadros tão desafiadores, fruto de eventos aparentemente onipotentes, se depreende 
em todo instante, uma carga de força que é capaz de se reinventar, ou seja, a sua capacidade de criar. Portanto, a resposta dada pelo que se supera e redime é a criação artística. A arte é o antídoto contra todo o conformismo passivo, contra todo o pessimismo e sentimento de estar vencido. A arte ativa o desejo e a vontade de mais, de nunca estar saciado, de dar sempre um passo além. Nietzsche viveu esses desafios em relação ao seu quadro clínico. Diante de suas terríveis dores de cabeça e estômago, teve que reinventar o seu dia a dia, seja pela produção intelectual e caminhadas, como pela busca infindável por ambientes que lhe fossem favoráveis diante de seu quadro de saúde. O ciclo do retorno para ele, nesse quadro clínico, se mostrou tenebroso, o que ele assumiu com firmeza e disposição afirmativa, tendo como resultado um produto intelectual profundo e profícuo. Assim, sua resposta, diante do peso aparentemente intransponível do fatum, foi a redenção pela sua capacidade estimulada em criar, transpor, reinventar. Portanto, a sua filosofia ela constitui uma forma de terapia. E o alvo principal ao qual Nietzsche pretende ampliar estas iniciativas terapêuticas é a cultura. Por essa razão, o filósofo alemão se mostra como médico da cultura. Na esteira da filosofia como uma forma de terapia, lembramos também o cuidado de si, o qual sinaliza Foucault, em que o filósofo, fazendo apologia a Sócrates, a seu conhece-te a ti mesmo, como aquele que não deve ser apenas o que ensina, mas que também cura. Por isso, o filósofo opera uma espécie de subordinação relativamente ao preceito do cuidado de si. O cuidado que se deve ter consigo mesmo reflete a dimensão total do indivíduo, desde sua epistemologia até sua fisiologia. Nietzsche, atento ao todo do indivíduo, como uh, a su, com a sua filosofia, protagoniza uma reinvenção que preside o seu próprio estilo linguístico aforismático, ao invés do discurso contínuo. Isso pareceria impossível para alguém como ele, que não podia se deter tanto tempo nas lides da produção intelectual, por causa principalmente de sua enfermidade nas vistas. Eis uma forma de cuidar de si. Nesse sentido, o filosofar em tempos marcados pelo ciclo do retorno grave e pesado requer repensar rotinas, desenvolver formas renovadas e continuar assumindo afirmativamente o grande peso. A pandemia filosófica não pode resultar em pandemia cultural, ou seja, a degenerescência, a doença física, não pode tomar conta do espírito, da vontade, do desejo, do sonho, das ações, mas, pelo contrário, pode e deve alavancar a vontade que quer e redime. Nietzsche vive grandes ciclos, do retorno marcados por mega eventos pandêmicos culturais, conduzindo à degenerescência dos costumes. Diante disso, o filósofo foi capaz de detectar, em meio a essa pandemia, um grande obstáculo que persistia em impedir a superação, persistia em conter todo o movimento de redenção, persistia em impedir a vontade e negar a vida, a moral. Nesse fator, a moral, o filósofo alemão detecta, desde a sua genealogia, toda a trajetória da pandemia decadencial que a humanidade viveu. Ora, se o sacerdote ascético se pretende o médico da cultura, mediante uma terapia da humanidade, Nietzsche, por seu lado, se investe como uma forma de terapia da própria terapia, ao invés de interpor a força pelos anticorpos capazes de resistir à pressão que pressiona de cima para baixo, o sacerdote ascético estimula a ouvir a voz da consciência mediante a fraqueza, o rebaixamento, o não à vida. Como ideal mais supremo, como aquele que deve ser buscado de modo a pautar toda a existência. E diante desse quadro pandêmico fisiológico, com suas respectivas ameaças degenerescentes à cultura, cabe a cada um assumir afirmativamente a vida não pelo sofrimento como algo que se deva buscar como um ideal ascético, mas como um fato a ser acolhido jubilosamente, pelo ativar das capacidades produtoras, pela interposição de resistência de onde emerge a força redentora. E para concluir, 
O itinerário que nós acabamos de percorrer nos permitiu avaliar pelas sendas nitianas as consequências da pandemia, não apenas e principalmente os efeitos fisiológicos, mas também, acima de tudo, os efeitos psicológicos. Se a fraqueza e a doença fisiológica provocam incapacidade e limites em agir, então a fraqueza e a doença psicológica impedem a principal fonte propulsora das forças, que é a vontade. A expressão dessa falta de forças, fraqueza e doença é incapacidade de interpor resistência frente às oposições. Na compreensão de Nietzsche, uma das mais graves doenças, diante do fato que se nos, nos apresenta marcado por uma onda gigantesca de pandemia que vem provocando doença e morte de inúmeras pessoas, somos mobilizados a dar uma resposta. Portanto, consiste num fato desafiador, potente, gigantesco e monstruoso de um quanto de forças capaz de ultrapassar, superar e redimir o grande peso desse mesmo fato. O filósofo alemão apresenta em diversas passagens de seus, seus escritos que a humanidade vive de tempos em tempos, tendo que superar desafios que permeiam os vários ciclos. São esses ciclos que emergem com força devastadora, atuando como oposição da qual demanda resistência. Assim, na medida em que maior forem os desafios e oposições, tanto maior a resistência e oposição que se lhe opõe, ou seja, maior o quantum de forças capazes de atuarem como superação da fraqueza e da doença. No entanto, a experiência da força via superação de obstáculos do fato implica em quedas e mergulho no caos, ou seja, em experimentar na plenitude o grande peso, sem fugas ou subterfúgios, acolhendo e amando o fato tal como ele é. É um amor de acolhida jubilosa o fato, pois não se coloca apenas na posição daquele que acolhe o fato com vistas à sua superação, mas, acima de tudo, como aquele que ama o fato e o deseja, o quer, não apenas uma vez, mas um número interminável de vezes, que sabe que o fato retorna e a cada retorno se inclinado a criativamente investir numa interposição de forças que resistem ao grande fato. A cada epiciclo que se vive, portanto, um quanto maior de força se depreende. Movimento esse capaz de sustentar e promover uma grande saúde e, consequentemente, a vida. Logo, cada ciclo do retorno que se vive Novas e mais potentes interposições de resistência são apresentadas num processo de criação sempre mais livre, suave e sublime, marcando o compasso dos ciclos do retorno, que se sucedem como uma dança rítmica, que é a arte, a propulsora da grande saúde. Por sua atenção, muito obrigado. Ok, professor Adilson, é, obrigado pela sua fala. Então, passa a palavra ao professor Hernan. Hernan, por favor, é, clique no seu microfone e você está com a palavra, então, a partir desse momento. Está bem? Sim, sí, aqui estou. Muito obrigado. É, vou tentar falar é, lentamente porque, bom, bueno, falo em castellano. Então, quero, quero fazer-me entender. Eh, agradezco antes que nada, en primer lugar, la, la invitación del profesor Adilson eh, que me contactó eh, y a, a la organización por, por haberme permitido participar en este, en este evento. Así que les doy un gran saludo desde, desde Chile. La pandemia, curiosamente, nos ha permitido acercarnos. Eh, antes... Eh, todas estas distancias se hacían tan largas y ahora parece que todo fuera está más a la mano. Bueno, voy a, a leer algunos puntos que me parecieron interesantes de la, de la conferencia del, del profesor Feiler para empezar ya a, la, a hacer algunas preguntas. Eh, el, el profesor parte diciendo que la estructura tiene que ver con grandes eventos que marcan etapas del gran retorno, del gran retorno de lo mismo. En, esas, en esos eventos uno es capaz de encontrar fuerzas promotoras de vida. Y destaco la fuerza, la fuerza como algo promotor de vida, eh, la fuerza como algo que, eh, de, que crea. 
que permite una nueva creación. Eh, la pandemia se podría entender como un antídoto redentor de la humanidad. Espero haber entendido todo bien, entre paréntesis. Eh, la COVID-19 entonces actuaría contra todas las dimensiones de la vida, contra todas las seguridades que tenemos en nuestra vida cotidiana. Eh, no sabemos qué es lo que vamos a hacer los próximos tres meses de acuerdo con, lo, con cómo prosiga esta famosa pandemia. Así que todos los planes a mediano, corto y largo plazo se, se fueron. Digamos. El Estado también, y este es un punto importante, empieza a dejar de lado la cultura. Eh, hoy día aparecía, si no me equivoco, en, el, en un diario inglés, donde le preguntaron a mil personas cuáles son las actividades eh, más eh, relevantes en estos momentos y, la más, y las más irrelevantes. Y el 71% dijo que las más irrelevantes es la del artista. En quinto lugar está también director de recursos humanos, pero esto nos, nos dice un poco eh, cómo están para la opinión pública las, eh, las, las prioridades. El, um, entonces, esta falta de cultura implica un empobrecimiento. La pandemia nos, no solamente nos empobrece eh, porque nos hace más débiles, sino que también nos empobrece económicamente y nos empobrece espiritualmente o culturalmente. Y en Nietzsche, el profesor Feiler eh, detecta algunas formas concretas de superación de la pandemia, o mejor dicho, de un restablecimiento de la salud. Entonces, la primera parte, cuando habla del sentido de la fuerza en Nietzsche, eh, en, la, en la frase que él rescata ¿no? de, la, de la genealogía de la moral, destaco, eh, ¿Quiénes son estos sobrevivientes, los que se impusieron? Conquista y peligro son condiciones de la gran salud, del gran amor y del gran desprecio. El, eh, solamente en, en alguna parte, en el, eh, en el prólogo, en, uno de los, en el prólogo de Zaratustra, ¿no? cuando se refiere al último hombre, eh, Nietzsche dice claramente que el último hombre no es capaz de despreciar porque en el fondo para despreciar hay que tener algo de grande en sí mismo y el último hombre no es capaz de tenerlo. Entonces, quien sobrevive esta gran, esta gran enfermedad, esta gran debilidad, quien se impone a la gran debilidad, parece, por lo que me parece entender, es el que es capaz de amar eh, con grandeza y despreciar también con grandeza. Sabe lo que le conviene y sabe lo que no quiere tener cerca. Y se da esta lucha de las fuerzas contra la, de, la debilidad. Parece que hubiera un, un, uh, un fuerte, una, esta es una constante. Eh, después voy a hacer una, una, la alusión más obvia que es Heráclito, eh, que quisiera darle un, un contexto, pero más, más adelante. Eh, asimismo, en la... En la en la modernidad habría un estancamiento de esta lucha de fuerzas. El racionalismo, en cierta medida, la racionalidad cae en el mecanismo. Y aquí, eh, si escuchan ruido entre paréntesis de fondo, eh, pido disculpas a mis hijos, <risa> que este es el momento en que ellos eh, tienen que comer un poco. Entonces, el, um, aquí yo hago mi primera pregunta. Um, en la modernidad, eh, Nietzsche tiene fresco, digamos, este, esta polémica que hay sobre el sistema. O sea, el sistema en Hegel alcanza, o sea, Hegel, el mismo Schelling. Eh, ellos plantean que la forma de la filosofía es el sistema. O sea, Schelling en el, en el, en el escrito sobre la libertad humana habla del de que el, el, el único sistema es el sistema de la libertad, en cierta medida. Y Hegel, en la, al comienzo de la enciclopedia, habla de la, que la filosofía solamente puede estar en el sistema. Pero el primer, 
el primer, por así decirlo, adalid del sistema es Espinosa, a quien se le, se le acusa de mecanicismo en el fondo. Niega la libertad a Espinosa. O sea, todo ocurre por una causa anterior. No hay una causa primera, sino que todo es, eh, es, todo es el despliegue de, este, de la sustancia. ¿no? Bueno, Nietzsche en algún momento eh, demuestra simpatía por Espinosa. Eh, pero no llega muy, 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 mucho más allá, especialmente en esta eh, identificación entre Dios y la naturaleza. Pero es interesante, eh, y hago la pregunta inmediatamente, entonces después continúo con, la, con, la, con mi reacción, profesor. El, eh, ¿Cómo podríamos entender este estancamiento de fuerzas eh, en el mecanismo? Y, y no sé si usted ve alguna alguna distinción entre mecanismo y sistema. Eh, Muy obrigado, profesor, eh, por la cuestión. Eh, primero, también agradeciendo su participación en este evento, né? Logo que fiz o convite, eh, respondeu afirmativamente a participar conosco eh, de, do Chile. E a sua pergunta é bastante instigante, professor eh, Hernán, na, no que diz respeito à questão sobre como Nietzsche eh, entende essa dimensão do sistema e dos mecanismos, a, a dimensão do mecanismo e do sistema que no fundo elas estão ligadas, né? são elementos que estão ligados dentro daquilo que seria o conjunto da, da crítica que Nietzsche endereça à modernidade, que no fundo, se nós formos ver, o grande intento do Nietzsche é superar a modernidade. E a modernidade, veja muito bem, ela começa já em Sócrates. Né? Modernidade em Nietzsche começa a partir de Sócrates, né? a partir do chamado o grande louvor advento da razão ocidental. E é, isso acho que é bastante interessante pensar agora dentro do, do, a partir do, do ponto de vista do sistema, né? Você traz aqui Spinoza e como Nietzsche também em certo momento também alimenta um, uma, um certo apreço por esse filósofo, pelo menos de alguns movimentos de sua filosofia, como a saber essa dimensão toda da, da substância universal, da identidade entre Deus e natureza, né? porque é uma concepção de totalidade, né? e o Nietzsche, no fundo, tem é, em grande estima tudo isso. Até, inclusive, como é, parte do meu trabalho doutoral, textos da juventude de Hegel, embora ele não tinha conhecido os textos, porque eles foram publicados muito depois, é, mas se ele tivesse os conhecido, certamente ele se identificaria também com esses textos da juventude do Hegel, né? que mostram uma dimensão vitalista muito forte, muito cara é, a, a concepção de Nietzsche. Então, nessa dimensão da concepção sistêmica, é o um grande problema, porque a, a, na concepção de força do Nietzsche, as forças elas são pulsões constantes. E, e as pulsões elas não podem ser governadas de uma maneira sistêmica, porque senão elas matam aquilo que é mais, é, digamos, o mais genuíno que se faz presente, a característica mais é, é presente nessas forças. Na medida que você estabelece algum processo de classificação, padronização, se mata aquilo que é próprio da vida, que as forças que querem se assenhorar, e esse assenhoramento ele vai se dando em momentos, instantes de plenitude. São instantes que se planificam. Né? E eles vão é, se planificando a cada momento. Um chega a um determinado ponto, que é chamado um ponto culminante de potência, mas logo dá espaço a outros e assim por diante. Né? E a cada momento é pleno. Então, isso não pode ter espaço dentro de um modelo sistêmico como é o modelo do sistema hegeliano, por exemplo. Eu faço uma aproximação no meu doutorado com o modelo hegeliano lá da juventude, ali eu consigo muito fazer esse movimento, mais os textos já da maturidade de Hegel, isso é, já é impossível. Né? Então, diria assim, a grande, o grande problema na, nessa aproximação 
do, da concepção de Nietzsche e no que diz respeito à visão sistêmica que se depreende da filosofia ocidental moderna se dá justamente pela maneira como as forças são é, acolhidas, pela maneira como elas são entendidas, pela maneira como elas são, no fundo, vividas, vivenciadas e experienciadas. É, ou seja, elas têm que ser vivenciadas e experienciadas tal como elas são na, de, de uma maneira extremamente fisiológica, é, que está querendo se assenhorar a todo momento e não pode se obedecer a padrão nenhum. O padrão, ele mata, porque o padrão estabelece já alguma forma de seleção, alguma forma de estabelecer algum tipo de causalidade, algum outro elemento que vai, no fundo, é, estabelecer né, um fundo grande, aquele perigo que o Nietzsche diz que é, no fundo, a, o estancamento das forças. Né? Então, elas não podem ter limites. Né? Isso tudo é, representa uma espécie de limites. Né? Assim eu entendo o Nietzsche. Né? Ok, muito muy bem. Continuo, porque isso também nos permitirá um pouco eh, acercar-nos hacia atrás. Digamos, não somente... Eh, bueno, hacia Sócrates y antes, ¿no? Entonces, en el segundo, en la segunda parte, usted habla ya de la genealogía de la salud. Entonces, es, eh, encontré muy interesante esta comparación de la debilidad física de Nietzsche, ¿no? Que no es una cosa, eh, digamos, de los últimos años, sino que lo acompaña toda su vida. Y, mientras, y cuando él más eh, débil se nota, cuando él ya va viendo que la, las fuerzas físicas se le, se le acaban, bueno, él, eso es una, es una aliciente, digamos, para que él pueda eh, producir más. Eh, hay una, si no me equivoco, esto lo dice Heidegger, en, ¿en qué significa pensar? Eh, cuando dice que Nietzsche... Después del Zaratustra, en el fondo, o en más, entre el Zaratustra y más allá del bien y del mal, eh, de, eh, ya no puede, por así decirlo, cuando tiene que abandonar la voluntad de poder, tiene que gritar. O sea, no puede darle una forma, por así decirlo, a su pensamiento, una forma, digamos, una, no, no puede contener su pensamiento en una obra, sino que empieza a dejar ciertos, eh, ciertas huellas, ciertos vestigios. Esta es la interpretación de, de Heidegger, ¿no? Entonces grita. Que los, últimos, eh, que los últimos escritos serían gritos. Yo no lo encuentro tan, tan, eh, tan justa esta interpretación, pero sí hay una, se nota una urgencia por, por afirmar eh, lo, lo, lo que él considera lo más importante y está también esta importancia de la fuerza. Una fuerza, el... Eh, esto que él, que él subraya al comienzo de la genealogía de la moral, por ejemplo, que la crueldad. O sea que en el fondo la crueldad también debe ser considerada, que ha sido condenada eh, continuamente, debería ser también considerada como parte de autoafirmación. En el fondo, eh, porque hablamos más que de crueldad, porque en el, en el, el, um, podemos hablar de una... De una Ah, se me, se, me, se me va la palabra en todos los idiomas, ¿no? Eh, es implacable. Alguien, es, alguien que es cruel es implacable, no tiene, no tiene piedad. Entonces, el, um, y eso implica, por ejemplo, hacer lo que hay que hacer o, o hacer lo que, lo, que, lo que aparece como mejor o imponerse incluso de manera, sin, sin, sin tomar en consideración que eso pueda provocar un gran sufrimiento. O sea, si es necesario amputar un miembro, hay que amputarlo. Entonces, eh, aquí termino con esta gran salud, se impone al peso más pesado. Y cómo se impone es de manera liviana, de manera ligera, como, como dice usted, como una danza. ¿no? El, eh, entonces, Quería un poco que conversáramos sobre la pandemia. En este, mi, mi segunda, mi, mi, mi pregunta va por este lado. O sea, la, el virus es implacable. El virus aparece como esta fuerza que simplemente se impone o, o, o busca eh, 
eh, más, eh, busca imponerse. Porque el virus, como no es un ser vivo, lo único que hace es simplemente replicarse en un ambiente propicio. Nosotros, me imagino que les llegaron informaciones que nuestro el anterior ministro de Salud hasta el, el domingo renunció. Eh, una de las estupideces que dijo eh, y, que, y que fueron reproducidas a nivel mundial fue que esperemos que el virus en algún momento se convierta en una buena persona y deje de atacar a la gente. O sea, todavía está esperando el premio Nobel. Y, y resulta que el razonamiento inverso es el que se aplica. Porque al principio podemos decir que el virus era buena persona, pero con eso no se, no se multiplicaba, no se replicaba. En cambio, cuando comienza a ser despiadado, que esa era la palabra que estaba buscando, cuando comienza a ser despiadado, nosotros tenemos el problema porque es esto que se extiende. Es este virus que se extiende porque simplemente se replica. Entonces, eh, la gran salud implicaría eh, que uno tiene que ser despiadado para imponerse. O sea, uno tiene que, eh, esa fuerza implica que uno se para sobre los hombros de sí mismo y continúa. No se ve de, de, eh, engullido por lo, que, por, lo que lo, por lo que lo rodea o, o, o por, su, por las condiciones, en cierta medida. Eh, ¿Podría un poco escuchar su reflexión al respecto de cómo, cómo, cómo podría, en este juego de fuerzas, cómo podríamos eh, encuadrar al, al virus? Muito obrigado, professor, pelas questões. Eu acho que assim toca num ponto assim que é o ponto fulcral aqui da é, dessa conferência. É, eu é, estou inclusive preparando um artigo em que eu trago a leitura que George Agamben sobre essa questão da pandemia. E ele tem uma uma posição também bastante forte no que diz respeito a isso, que no fundo se avizinha a concepção Nietzscheana, que é a concepção da afirmação da vida. E é interessante como o Agamben questiona, inclusive, as autoridades que estão pedindo, né, não só pedindo, mas também ordenando o isolamento social. Ou seja, isso é uma forma de fazer, na leitura dele, o Agamben, de fazer com que as pessoas é, deixem de afirmar a sua vida deixe de afirmar quem elas são e elas passam, no fundo, a ter que obedecer um mandato em que priva aquilo que elas deveriam poder estar usufruindo livremente, né? como, isso como uma espécie de não liberdade. Né? Então, é, se avizinha, eu diria, da concepção nietzscheana até certo ponto. É, o, o meu artigo que eu estou preparando está é, trabalhando nessa, nessa linha. Por quê? O Nietzsche, ele apresenta na dimensão das forças que nós temos que ativar as forças. E como nós vamos ativar as forças na medida que nós vamos interpor resistência? É, ou seja, por um lado, nós temos a, os obstáculos e, por outro lado, a resistência. Sem obstáculo não vai ter resistência, ora, não vai ter força. Por isso que ele sempre diz que em tempos de paz, as forças elas vão, que elas vão se tornando acéfalas, elas vão diminuindo, porque nós não temos como ativá-las como foi o caso é, os, é, os nossos primatas no que diz respeito à invenção do fogo. A arcada deles ela começou a se, no fundo, é, a diminuir né, de, em termos de, de força, de potência, porque é, já não precisava mais usar tudo aquilo. Né? O fogo já fez o trabalho. Então, nesse sentido também, grandes eventos, tal como Nietzsche apresenta, né, que são permeados por toda, todo, a cada é, rodada do retorno, esses eventos eles têm que ser vividos da sua forma mais genuína. O Nietzsche ele, ele viveu isso de uma forma muito forte. Né? Em um momento, eu usei a expressão rocha. Né? A comunidade nietzscheana logo já certamente já soube do que eu estava fazendo referência. É o lugar, a rocha, em forma de pirâmide, que o Nietzsche teve a visão do eterno retorno do mesmo. Essa rocha representa a força, que esse é um grande, um mega evento, uma mega doutrina, o eterno retorno. 
E nós temos que estar prontos a viver tudo que nós já vivemos, viver novamente. Mas não só o que é suave, o que é bonito, o que é fácil, o que é, que é, é tranquilo, mas o grande peso, viver o grande peso. Então, a humanidade já viveu grandes pandemias também, já viveu guerras inúmeras, mas sobreviveu, né? É, os antigos dizem né, que também houveram chuvas de meteoro que destruíram primatas, espécies inteiras da, da face da Terra. Algumas persistiram, entraram em mutação, se adaptaram. O mesmo processo Nietzsche fez grande, durante grande parte de sua vida. Ele foi se adaptando, é, buscando é, achar formas com que ele pudesse seguir adiante. É, ou seja, ele, teve que, ele viveu em vários lugares, né, achando um clima favorável né, para poder, no fundo, dar conta de viver com tantas doenças. Né, as cartas dele estão recheadas de é, sintomatologias em termos de doenças terríveis. Dias, semanas, com enxaquecas, com dores as, as mais in, 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 inimagináveis. Ele passou por tudo isso. Agora, isso que é um ponto interessante... Esse período de 88, 87, 88, é o período em que a, a, a situação de saúde do Nietzsche ela se torna mais precária. E é o período da maior produção dele. Veja o texto, que é a obra-prima, hoje a comunidade Nietzscheana mundial tem, na genealogia da moral, a obra mestra do Nietzsche. Né? É produto desse período. Veja, né? um sujeito que estava vivendo aquela situação, ele, ele teve ali uma espécie de desencadeador de grande saúde. Agora, é como você se coloca, é a disposição, como você se coloca diante do grande peso, ou seja, da grande, do grande problema, seja ele qual for. Você pode colocar de uma forma afirmativa. Agora entra aquilo que você coloca. Como nós vamos afirmar uma situação dessas? Como afirmar um peso, uma pandemia que é uma, um, um vírus que é microscópico e que mata e que não respeita classe nenhuma, raça nenhuma? Né? Então, como que é isso? O Agamben, ele, novamente eu trago ele porque ele tem um trabalho, certamente você conhece, que é sobre Auschwitz, né? como pensar Auschwitz a partir do eterno retorno, que ele vê como um, um problema no Nietzsche, né? Como, porque como você vai querer desejar algo como Auschwitz? Né? Querer desejar, não é? o, o, o retorno à disposição afirmativa é desejar que aquilo que passou volte novamente, e não uma só vez, mas inúmeras vezes. É o grande peso. Né? Então, vejo nesse ponto aqui, o Nietzsche ele está é, com toda a sua força buscando superar a modernidade. É um movimento que ele interpõe de superação da modernidade aqui. Né? Superar a modernidade naquilo que ela coloca como interposição, naquilo que ela coloca como limite, né? a dimensão do limite, da interposição, da relação, da relação causa-efeito. E aqui se avizinha o pensamento do Agamben no que diz respeito a essa dimensão da crítica às autoridades públicas é, no que diz respeito ao distanciamento social. Ou seja, ali é ou você se distancia ou você vai sofrer penalidades. Ou seja, a dimensão afirmativa de Nietzsche não pode ter isso. Não pode ter isso ou aquilo. É afirmar, é o grande peso, é afirmar mesmo. Né? É dar esse passo além. Né? E nesse sentido, o que conta aqui, eu acho que essa é a grande contribuição, é a disposição como se coloca diante disso. Como nós nos colocamos afirmativamente. Não simplesmente... É, se baseando naquele princípio do ideal ascético, que diz, não faça isso, não faça aquilo. Mas e como que nós vamos interpor aqui uma terapia dessa terapia, no fundo? É o movimento que o Nietzsche faz, porque o sacerdote ascético não dá a resposta. Ele coloca simplesmente problemas. Ele coloca um peso maior e impossibilita dar o salto necessário em termos de afirmação, ou seja, em outras palavras, de disposição de ânimo, que isso nos toca de uma maneira frontal e isso toca a cultura. Quando se fala em degeneração de cultura, 
é a generescência de forças fisiológicas que implicam nessa dimensão de como, o qual a disposição afirmativa que nós nos colocamos diante dos fatos. Sejam eles de que ordem for, ela tem que ser sempre afirmativa. É, muito bem, professora Johnson, é, é isso. É, nós agradecemos muitíssimo a fala de vocês, eu acho que é um, é um, outro, um outro olhar. É, retomando que nós tivemos uma mesa redonda na, na segunda passada, em que a temática foi sobre o uso da cloroquina ou não, e toda essa discussão entre ciência e valores, bioética, e foi muito interessante. Na noite seguinte, nós tivemos, então, aquele debate... É, o, com um olhar sociopolítico sobre a temática da pandemia. A seguir, nós tivemos um olhar é, é, ético sobre o, a temática da, da, da pandemia. E ontem, então, do ponto de vista da, da psiqui, psiquiatria, psicologia, é, nós tivemos um olhar é, do ponto de vista do que se chama de saúde mental. E hoje, então, Agradecemos, então, a sua fala com esse olhar, essa perspectiva de Nietzsche e o debate, então, do professor Hernan. Agradecemos, então, muitíssimo. E, e como nós estamos ao vivo, é, eu só pediria, então, que vocês é, desligassem o microfone, tá, professor? Ah, ó, já estão desligados, eu estou vendo aí. E a gente está tentando fazer contato com o professor Michael, tá? É, aos... É, e eu estou vendo que, eu, eu não sei se o contato, então, já foi feito. Vocês podem permanecer aí na tela, tá? Podem, eh, podem continuar presentes aqui. Saber que nós não podemos eh, desligar agora o evento, embora a gente tenha uns minutos para fazer esse ajuste técnico com o professor Michael. Eh, e estamos, então, em gravação. Então, todos saibam que estamos gravando. Now to, uh, so, uh, 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 before before I present you and uh, let me introduce the uh, the meeting. But now you are seeing Marcelo, Marcelo, uh, this is Marcelo, Marcelo de Araújo. Uh, 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 he will be the commentator of your uh, speech. And uh, uh, Michael, uh, 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 in the beginning of the conference, I will speak something in Portuguese. Okay. Yes. Uh, for the participants, and then I explain to you in, in English, and uh, the idea is that you made the conference first, and after Marcelo and me, uh, we'll make uh, com comments, uh, replies, on and questions for you, and then uh, we'll try to uh, uh, get some questions from the participants and send it to you. They will not participate with as us, but they are seeing us and uh, 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 this is the, the idea, and and so uh, uh, Luis Roden, are you seeing Luis Roden in front of us? Uh, uh, yeah. You remember Luis Roden? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Luis Roden. Hi, is Michael. Hello. So, but Roden says that now I'm the go I'm the boss, and so. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah? You okay. are. Okay. It's so, it's up to oh. me. <laughs> How long would you want me to speak for? Because I'm a bit worried now. It's, I'm really thrown by this very stressful thing of not being able to get into the meeting. It's yeah. really weird, all that stuff. And I, I, I've got. I, I was going to talk around slides and do a PowerPoint. Is that going to be okay? Uh, people, people, uh, we we uh, uh, we think that people are expect expected to be with us for two hours and a half at least. Okay. Oh, and so. Okay. Uh, yeah, the problem is for you because uh, you are in another time and so it's you are right. tired. No, uh, but for us it's uh, 7 30 now. Okay, uh, right. and, and then uh, I think you can present your uh, make your presentation with the slides. And uh, uh, if, if we spend two half an hour, uh, uh, two, two hours and a half, I think it's okay. Uh, uh, Luis, can I? Uh, begin. Yes, yes. Do you want to? Do you want to say something? We are recording now. Do you want to say something? No, no, no. You can, you can do the, the things now. Uh, I, I, I will, I will speak something in Portuguese uh, uh, and 
Uh, let, uh, well, uh, peço, uh, bom, a, a todos os participantes que estão nos acompanhando, nós uh, uh, estamos uh, com a nossa conferência uh, uh, de término, na verdade, do nosso evento uh, Filosofia em Tempos de Pandemia. Uh, nós tivemos, na verdade, duas semanas de atividades. Na semana passada, tivemos uh, três dias de uh, conferências e nessa semana, ontem tivemos uma conferência à noite e hoje tivemos duas. Na verdade, acabamos de concluir uma e agora vamos uh, uh, fazer a conferência de encerramento. Tá? Eu vou... Uh, 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 essa conferência será toda em inglês. Né? O, uh, nós não temos ainda tecnologia para fazer tradução simultânea no sistema, uh, mas uh, eu espero que as pessoas consigam acompanhar, nós pedimos ao Michael para que ele fizesse apresentações em slides, para que as pessoas que não uh, conseguem acompanhar uh, o inglês com perfeição, uh, possam acompanhar os slides e lerem, né? e isso eu creio que vai facilitar. Uh, eu, vou, uh, uh, pra, eu vou apresentar para vocês rapidamente o um, um currículo do professor Michael, eu vou, fa eu vou fazer uh, uma, um resumo do currículo dele em português e depois eu leio rapidamente uh, em inglês para dar início à atividade. O professor Michael Laughlin é professor de filosofia aplicada e atualmente ele é co-diretor uh, da universidade, do instituto, na verdade, uh, dentro da universidade, uh, uh, University of West London, uh, do Instituto para a Saúde e o Cuidado centrado na pessoa e também é visitou, é, professor visitante é, no Departamento de Ciências Cirúrgicas é, the Newfield Department of the Surgical Science da Universidade, da, da Escola de Medicina da Universidade de Oxford. Ele, ele é filósofo de formação, não é médico, mas tem é, trabalhado já, há, há, bom, acredito, e aqui não diz, mas certamente há mais de 20 anos, na área que ele costuma chamar de Health Philosophy, seria nós traduzimos por Filosofia da Saúde. É, alguns chamam de Filosofia da Medicina porque muitos temas têm a ver com a medicina, mas é amplo, na verdade, não, não envolve somente a medicina. Ele tem um livro que chamou muito a atenção, que foi um livro que foi publicado em 2002, que é o Ethics, Management and Mythology, onde ele discute que é temas de bioética, é, sobre, entre outras coisas, o uso das evidências em políticas de saúde. É um livro que trata principalmente do, do, do conceito de managed care na área da saúde. É, e desde hum, a, 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 eu, eu, alguns anos ele é, é editor associado é, do Journal of Evaluation Clinical Practice, onde ele edita é, os volumes especiais na área de filosofia da saúde. Uh, também uh, é editor do Debates in Value Based Practice Arguments for and Against, e entre outras atividades. Eu vou, uh, uh, como por exemplo, uh, ser também uh, 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 co-participante. Na verdade, ele foi, uh, ele é atualmente diretor do projeto sobre uh, o programa de Literature Database Program. Uh, e colaborador do Center for Value Based Practice no St. Catherine College, na Universidade de Oxford. Uh, então, Michael já esteve na Unicinos, uh, já esteve na Unicinos por duas vezes, convidado por mim para um evento que a gente realizou em 2015, depois, uh, um ano depois, eu acho que foi em 2016, que é um simpósio que nós uh, consideramos como um simpósio internacional em filosofia da medicina. O evento que ele veio ele tratou de temas como medicina baseada em evidências, crítica e, e questões uh, correlatas uh, à área da administração né, uh, em saúde. E também depois nós uh, convidamos eles, uh, ele mais recentemente, para tratar do tema sobre saúde centrada na, uh, na pessoa. Uh, o, isso foi o, o penúltimo evento. Esse ano nós devemos contar com a participação dele novamente em outubro para o evento que nós vamos organizar, que é o colóquio de filosofia e também o quarta edição do Simpósio Internacional em Filosofia da Medicina. Uh, well, uh, Michael, I was uh, uh, reading something about your curriculum. Uh, I don't know if you 
grasp some words in Portuguese, and I will <laughs> I will present you again, but shortly. Uh, uh, and I uh, I'm seeing in the internet uh, of I, I, uh, it's from the University of West London, and it says that you are professor in applied philosophy and co-director of the University of West London European Institute for Person-Centered Health and Social Care and mm -hmm. academic visitor of the Nudfield Departments of Surgical Science, University of Oxford Medical School. All, all the things I said in Portuguese, so I will not repeat now because it's, <laughs> people uh, has <laughs> and, and knew this already. And uh, the idea is to uh, give you the word now and uh, make the presentation. I don't know if you know how to uh, uh, display your uh, uh, slides for us, uh, you know? Uh, well, there's a thing which says share desktop, so I'm assuming if I press that. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can see my desktop now. Yeah. But, so if I then go, where, where's my article gone, right? If I look at this, can what can you see now? Can you see? Um, can you see anything? No, no, look, you can begin. Why is it gone black? It's, it's, it's with you now. Why is the screen gone black? I just pressed. Ah, uh, there. Can you see anything now? No, it's uh, still not. You can't see anything. So I'm not actually sharing I, my screen. Uh, 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 Luis, do you know Ma what, what, what? No, this? no. Mar Marco, eu eu tô com o texto dele aqui. Eu vou mandar para o Matheus e o Matheus so uh, põe ele na tela. Tá. But, but, but it's not so better I that he do that. He does that. Let me see. I press I share. Did anything happen? 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 Did anything anything now? We are trying. Uh, uh, there is something yes. in the. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Now it's yes. on screen. No. It says bad network quality. Ah, right. No, I can't switch over. Can you see the fair slide there? Yes. So you can see written up ethics, rationing, and the COVID 19 pandemic. Yes? Yes. yes. That's yes. Okay. That's yes. Just OK, and I can see Marco in the corner of my screen, but I can see this. All right. Well, I'll try to talk around these points. I say it's it's thrown me. A, it's <laughs> this is more challenging than any real face to face conference by a long shot. <laughs> I hope you can if people can't understand, then come in and say if I'm speak if I'm because my apologies, obviously, I've only got English. Uh, I can't speak Portuguese. Um, so it's saying try turning off the video, but no, I can't turn. I can't turn my video off because that would be a mistake and you were to see my screen. Um, so you can read that ethics rationing and the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, first do no harm. OK, so my apologies. Yeah, I mean, so I'll try and talk. Yeah, <laughs> give as clear an account of this as I can. Um, Basically, this was initially, it was in your program as ethical principles rushing the COVID and the COVID-19 pandemic. But I thought this was I thought this was a better title given what I was actually saying. And I've added first do no harm because it seems to me the thing that we as philosophers have to learn, we do need to learn something from the Hippocratic Oath here. We should not, we should, you know, minimally we should not make anything worse. We should try to make things better, but at the very least, we should avoid doing any harm. Um, and so it might seem strange to think that philosophy can do some harm, but I Potentially it can, as I'll try to argue. Hopefully people got the abstract associated with this, so you've got some idea of the arguments. Um, you know, but um, and at the end of this, I've also forwarded these slides to the conference organisers because there's a list of references at the end. So when I reference people, you can look, you know, if I've got someone's name in brackets after a quote, you can look at the end and find out where that's from. Um, so. Um, Basically, what I was trying to do. Oh, hang on. It's not. Uh, it is now, right? OK. Um, right. I was looking at this pandemic, at this pandemic and trying to, to think about a positive outcome of the pandemic. And I do apologize. Um, 
you know, I mean, obviously the pandemic is horrible. It's not really, I'm not trying to be like Donald Trump, you know, always trying to find something wonderful has come out of everything, you know, says, so, you know, there's some beautiful things that come out of this pandemic, you know, when he noticed that, you know, workers were going to work without uh, proper protective equipment. And he said, you know, this is a beautiful sight, whatever. I'm not trying to uh, ha get anything false positive out of this. Um, but nonetheless, I'm trying to, you know, so that one, some good things might come out of this. Um, and I was, you know, that would be the opening of the abstract where I said horrific events can precipitate change. Really terrible things can give us the inspiration to change things. Um, and so, you know, the, the live videoing of this, the man in America being killed, that George Floyd, has brought a great call from all sorts of people. It's given a sense of outrage and, basically, and brought a great call for change, which may or may not be, make a difference. But people are at least talking about things in the American system now. Um, you know, when you look at the police, I mean, whatever we think about the systemic racism in that case, the fact that in America, the way American society is structured, there's such a hostility to welfare spending, that um, social issues and mental health issues all end up at the hands of the police. So that young man who was shot a few days ago, who had serious mental health problems, the police didn't know what to do and ended up shooting him. Um, but there's no money spent on mental health services. Uh, to help people in the way they need. And so one of the things they're talking about in America is changing the funding in all sorts of ways. And, you know, these horrific events might precipitate change. Now, similar, you know, so horrific events oh, can create a shift in our thinking sometimes and change our conception of the practical, of what is ruled in and ruled out. So all sorts of things in the States, in the United States, which they said they can't change, they are now thinking they might be able to change. Um, and Similarly, it seems to me, um, you know, with the COVID pandemic, governments across the world knew the risks of something like this happening, but the structures in place meant it wasn't in anyone's interest to take measures to reduce the potential impact uh, or to think about ways of preventing such things from happening. Um, and it may well be there's all sorts of things that you know what we would like to think you know as I, i'm in touch with all sorts, maybe i'm just in touch with a too too radical a group of people but obviously various groups so in the uk for instance the way the homeless people and refugees have been treated we're hoping that we can bring something good out of that and say well are we really when the lockdown is over in britain are we going to just throw all the homeless people back out on the streets or are we going to try to have a more civilized solution um and you know the, the way internationally refugees are treated, that we have at least an option, a possibility to call for broader changes than would normally have been deemed practical. Um, now, amongst other things, well, when we look at you know the, the COVID issue, some of us in applied philosophy for a long time have been calling for unmapping the borders of health and social care. So saying that we can't think about health care and social care as completely discrete entities. And there have been statements, you know, about social, about social well-being in policy and practice documents across the world. But there hasn't been massive change. Um, and at least what we're seeing now is a growing recognition of interlinked issues. So global poverty, environmental injustice, and the interests of the developed world. Thus, you know, we're trying to argue that the, the, the wealthy countries can't neatly separate their interests as they've tried to do for so long from people in the people in the rest of the world who are suffering appalling social injustices. Um, and so You had talks, haven't you? I think you know already in this conference. I noticed you had something on Homo econom uh, economus and the problems of that, and the environmental crisis and issues. So the, that sort of philosophy, you've already talked about to some extent. I'd be interested to. I would have been interested to hear what the content of those talks were. Um, but there is a hope that our interests, seeing our interests as, as linked, could be the best way to develop a basis for recovery from this global catastrophe. Let us see. It is a global problem, and you know maybe we have to think about it from a more you know global perspective. But that notion of broadening the debate is a possible good outcome, it seems to me, if it works out. I don't know, but um, there are issues about uh, well, how do we as philosophers make a contribution to this? 
And so what I wanted to talk about was two different approaches to philosophy, to applied philosophy in particular. And I, I, again, I hope people have seen the abstract. I tried to make it clear there. Um, so the, in terms of approaches to applied philosophy, on the one hand, there is the debate, the, the approach which I've just outlined about broadening debates. Um, and that's in some ways is the traditional role of philosophy to ask kind of underlying questions um, to to look at the assumptions of and context which give rise to practical problems. And you, know, you go back to Socrates and that was a favourite of he was always asking difficult questions and saying, well, why do you why do you think that is re relevantly similar to that? He was always asking people to explain the, the remit for their thinking. Now, in contrast to that, we've also seen an approach um, of a good many years now, which is based on the idea that we should be focusing on specific problems and dilemmas and providing solutions to them. And particularly the notion of rationing in healthcare of medical scarce medical resources has been a major issue to be looked at in this context. Um, and this raises questions about what you might call the remit of practical philosophy. So the distinction between practical and background issues. And there are some philosophers who've been saying, look, we need to actually move away from the broadening approach and be clearer um, and you know, talk about specific issues and not try to settle every question every time we sit down for debate. So, um, and there are economic reasons for that. If, if you're hired to do a research project for an organisation, that organisation probably doesn't want challenging questions. It wants, solutions or at least procedures or principles that can give it solutions or now um you know and as people point out you know well you well you want to you know i mean socrates would never have probably would never have got a research grant um they didn't give you know the athenian government didn't give socrates a lot of money they gave him hemlock to drink um because the, you know, so, so there's an argument that if we are to be accepted by organizations in the real world then we should have a more focused approach um and this revolves around the application of moral theory to real world issues i'm putting that in inverted commas because quite a lot of philosophers have used that term sometimes in real in inverted commas themselves i'll quote a few in a bit but it raises issues of philosophical methodology it raises questions about how do we do philosophy in a meaningful way and apply it. So you know, this, what does it mean to apply moral theory to the real world? It's something that a lot of people in, in, in ethics think they, they're doing. Um, and it raises questions about the borders between ethics and political and social philosophy. So on the one hand, you know, it might be difficult. This this might this these this distinctions might be intuitively unclear. We might think the borders from are unclear. But there are some authors who want to talk about ethical problems that face individuals and put as background issues the political and social background to those issues so we're not debating we're being practical we're not debating them today we're looking at the problems for this individual or this group uh, the ethical problems in particular and tell them how can they solve their problems ethically now my argument will be that is okay you can do that so long as you accept that to some of the questions you ask there may be no non-arbitrary answer and that's what, a lot, as we'll see, that's what a lot of applied ethicists don't want to accept. That you know, part of their notion of good methodology is that, given the world as it is, you should be able to find right and wrong answers to specific ethical questions. Um, and I'll try and illustrate that with some, some points from the debate. But is that making sense so far? Is that okay so far? Yeah. Um, two approaches. Obviously, if people can't hear me, then wave around and shout um so i'm talking about applied ethics then now um insofar as that term is used it's been used in lots of different ways but it ref it's been reused to refer to a group of things so we in initially people talk about medical ethics then people would expand the terminology and talk about healthcare ethics and realize that to make issues relevant for a broader range of health practitioners the term bioethics is used there are some authors um including this South American author Michael Cosso, who's who have made claims that bioethics is somehow become a distinct discipline. It's moved away. It's not philosophy anymore. It's an, it's a, a discipline that's grown out of philosophy in some way. Uh, there are others who think it's part of philosophy, but professional ethics are so things like business ethics. Um, and again, you know, this distinction between practical and background makes a big difference there. So in most applied discussions of business ethics, 
you won't often find dis you know, discussions of Marxism uh, and the claim that, well, all capitalist projects are inherently self contradictory and unsustainable, for instance. You will leave that out and you will simply say, given we have this particular problem in business, how can we be as ethical as possible? Um, and the thing about the ethics of warfare, moving way beyond not just the, uh, you know, the stuff that we all know, you know, the, 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 the theories, you know, St. Thomas's theories of the just war and so forth, but to people having seminars where they talk with military organisations of one kind or another and talk about actually you know how to do certain types of extreme violence in an ethical manner um, there's there's been debates about that ethics of journalism I went to a talk on the ethics of construction management earlier in my career which surprised me but you know apply, there's a lot of areas in professional ethics where you look at someone's job and try to talk about how they can do it more or less ethically um, and in each time case the, the the idea is to find practical advice for decision makers be they policy makers or practitioners Practical. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, 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 the slide you are talking about is the third or the second, uh, but we are seeing only the first. Oh no! Uh, You're not uh, seeing the rest of this. Uh, yeah. Yes. Now, uh, try to try to advance the the the, the slides or. or well, I have, done this. I, I have advanced it, so I thought I don't know how. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Uh, I don't know. I don't know either. Uh, uh, well, I press share oh, screen and this is what's on my screen. Let me see with someone. Uh, uh, you should to let the presentation. Well, uh, Mateus is saying to us in the chat. Uh, uh, because, uh, well, the, the presentation, I think, I think, I think is freezing. Uh, <laughs> uh, could you? Could you try to do again uh, and uh, uh, this or not? Uh, ah, now, now, now it's happening. Now, now it's in the right, uh, right slide. What you, what did you do? <laughs> I must escape from So maybe what I have to do. So now, can you see the second slide? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. What I'll do is I'll I won't do the slide show then. I'll just click on one slide then the next because that seems to cause less problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the third slide, right? You can see that applied ethics. Yes. Now I now we see Okay. That. Well, all I'll do is I'll just I'll just move along through that. I won't try. It was coming up one line at a time. You see what I mean? Which is what I would do normally, but if that's going to create problems, then I'll just show the, the whole slide each time. Yeah. yeah so, okay. So justice in priority setting, right? Can you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying here is right. A key issue is justice in priority setting. So issues such as you know the funding of essential services, bedside rationing, and you know just priority setting is a broader term and it can have a variety of meanings and it's often liked by some authors because it's more positive, it has a more positive sound than rationing. Rationing is about what you cut, priority setting is what you prioritise and of course but it's also an ambiguous term or, or a broad term not some, because it can mean anything from some uh, you know a doctor in an emergency situation making triage decisions where you just have to see you've got five patients they're all injured and there's only you there who do you treat first and you well the most in the one who looks like he's going to die first for instance um there's that and there's this yeah you know, but it also covers you know we've got a budget this big which of the services that we currently provide do we have to cut that man health managers might have to make. And the issue of bedside rationing. So there was a Norwegian author um, called Vegard Vila who asked me to come in to a, um, a particular debate he was having with some Norwegian bioethicists. Vila's background, he's a clinician, and he argued against bedside rationing and said that what they meant by bedside rationing couldn't be done ethically and that he was, wasn't going to do it. And they said that he was being um, ir ir irrational and irresponsible and not understanding certain things about this. And he asked me to come in. So I'll talk a little bit about that debate um, and what I think the interesting things that that revealed about their notions of um, methodology in applied ethics in particular um, and what, what divided them and, and Vila. And the, the authors, the Norwegian authors were, I don't know if you, if you people have met them or heard of them, Ma, um, Morten Magelson and colleagues, 
but they had a debate in the Journal of Political Ethics and I was invited to, to join this. He wanted me to because he'd been using arguments from my book, which I'd written a not good number of years earlier, and he wanted me to come in to try and explain these points to the, the people he was debating with his interlocutors. Um, so applied ethics in this sense, it covers these issues, but we're looking, I'm looking particularly at rationing, and I'll try and say something about how this has been used in the COVID crisis shortly as well. Now, OK, the goals of applied ethics. Again, can you see the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. OK. OK, so the goals of applied ethics. Well, in this case, well, first of all, this is a quote from Michael Lockwood to apply philosophical expertise to the real world. And Lockwood does use that phrase and he says it's a, he, he's talking about the idea of a philosopher being on an ethics committee. And he says, wouldn't it be? Yeah, it's marvelous to think of philosophy for once impinging on the real world. Now, I think philosophy. So, right. So Lockwood talks about, you know, a, 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 a a philosopher sitting on the government ethics committee and says it would be it's marvelous to think of philosophy impinging on the real world. Now I think philosophy does impinge on the real world in all sorts of ways in that philosophical debates frame our thinking um, in, in, in all sorts of ways that people don't even think about most of the time and there are underlying assumptions to everything we say but I'm not sure that I agree with Lockwood that a philosopher sitting on an ethics committee is particularly an indication of philosophy impinging on the real world in the sense that he seems to me he does make an allusion to the notion of the philosopher king at one point in that now i'm not sure that i you know i agree with that but i'll try to explain why um but also these next two quotes are from my norwegian interlocutors the people i had the debate with in the journal of clinical ethics uh magelson and colleagues the, the, the goal is to instigate transparent priority setting based on morally justified criteria and to make the best use of health resources to reduce the negative impact of scarcity. So one has a broadly sort of Kantian or Rawlsian feel to it there, doesn't it? The notion of transparent, morally justified criteria. Um, uh, the other has a kind of utilitarian flavour to it, making the best possible use of resources and reducing the negative impact of scarcity. Um, and there's also the claim that from the Chilean uh, bioethicist Michael Cotto, that it's it's about cultivating ethical excellence to enrich the texture of ethical decision making. And Cotto makes explicit what other bioethicists seem to imply at certain points that bringing in of ethics in this sense to debates will make the de the discussion and the debate more ethical and perhaps make its outcomes more ethical in some way, um, which is obviously. That takes some arguing because otherwise it's just a fallacy of ambiguity. Um, you know, when you think about it, we all know very well, you know, people who are experts in ethics as a theoretical discipline aren't necessarily the most ethical people in the world. Um, you know, they, um, I mean, I don't, I know it's wrong to speak of the dead. So, I mean, Roger Scruton's dead, so I should be careful not to say anything too nasty about <laughs> it. But um, if I wanted advice on Aristotle and I had to either ask my mother or Roger Scruton, I would have asked Roger Scruton were he alive because he knows a lot more about Aristotle than my mother ever could. She never had a, did any academic work in her life, but she was a very good person. If I wanted someone to ask someone advice on bringing up a child, I would definitely ask my mother and not Roger Scruton because I think he would be a horrible parent, whereas my mum would, would, would give good advice on how to bring up children. So that you need to, you need, they need to explain how bringing in people who are qualified in ethics necessarily makes decision making processes more ethical in, in some sense of the word. Um, now, is that OK so far? People can still hear me, yeah? Yes. OK, so I'll say something about methods here, right? So the methods, well, Applying theories of value, rights, justice, so things like deontology, utilitarianism and increasingly virtue ethics informing these debates to pressing moral problems and dilemmas. And the term dilemmas isn't used as much now as it used to be. It used to be all the time talk about an ethical dilemma. Uh, of course, strictly speaking, the word dilemma means something which has no uh, determinate solution, but it seems to be a bit used in a different way. Um, difficult moral problems and to replace intuitive, emotional or sentimental reactions with, quote, impartially applied general principles as a basis for priority setting. And there I'm quoting again my Norwegian interlocutors, Magelson and colleagues. They made that point in their paper very clearly, suggest they have an argument that intuitions need to be replaced with something which is more formal and can be 
understood impartially and applied impartially criteria for priority setting. And I just thought I'd put in a couple of examples. There. So the wonderful, of course, the really famous book, Beauchamp and Childress, Principles of Biomedical Ethics, um, their approach to principalism there, and quality, uh, quality of life measures. Now that's, I'm quoting Alan Williams there. Now he is a phil um, an economist primarily, but the quality of life measures has been a huge part of this debate, and so, especially so far as it's had practical implications. And Williams has written some interesting stuff on ethics and health economics and their role in practical decision making. And he's famous for inventing the quality adjusted life year, which has had a huge influence over policy, certainly in the United Kingdom, in the National Health Service. Um, the, the reason why you get demonstrations of elderly people outside, you, know, you don't normally get big demonstrations made up largely of people over 60 um, anywhere in the world, but you do in Britain from time to time because NICE has made its latest decision using Williams's quality adjusted life year and it has surprise surprise as usual cut services to the elderly um, because they always do badly in these calculations because they're seen as having fewer life years ahead. Um, so applications well yeah development of codes of practice and guidelines ethics committees um you know so we know you know research ethics practice committees of one kind of other government ethics committees professional bodies these days you have you can't really be a plausible organization unless you have some sort of ethics committee um you know even you know, was, was it, the car phone warehouse has its uh, list of ethical values that it must adhere to. So when there were, it sponsored a TV programme in Britain in which there was lots of rather hideous racism and it came out with the statement that its ethics committee had said that racism was incompatible with the values of the car phone warehouse, which brought a lot of sneering from a lot of people in the UK. You know, what are the values of the car phone warehouse other than selling phones? Um, but nonetheless, you know, every organisation has its, an ethics committee um, and there are ethical advisors and ethical consultants. And of course, Cotto very much says he's an ethical consultant and his notion of bioethics is about, he says it's, it involves knowing enough medicine and philosophy to be an appropriate consultant for certain types of ethical question. And that's why he can rule out discussing political questions because he says he's not an appropriate consultant for those. Um, so monitoring cultures in professional life um, to ensure greater consistency in practice. And of course, there's an interesting side effect here, isn't there, which we're all aware of, um, which is the use of resources. These monitoring cultures, a lot of the time they are to combat the problems of ra you know, rationing and priority setting and to make the most efficient use of resources. But of course, the monitoring cultures that ethics committees create can add to the costs for organisations, because especially the resource of staff time, staff in all sorts of organisations complain that they have to spend a lot more time showing that they have conformed to the criteria for proper practice than they ever did before. And that then means that you're already taking resources out of the organisation when your problem is to solve the problem of how to take as few resources out of the organisation as possible and to make the most efficient use of the resources they have. Um, and we see national agencies to make provisions based not on local capacities, but on centrally agreed priorities. Now, again, I don't know, again, in your countries, how how big a problem this has been, but certainly in the United Kingdom for many years, there was a big debate about so-called postcode prescribing. And the argument was it seemed unfair that if you lived in one part of England, say the northeast, you could get access to certain resources, but you couldn't if you lived in the southeast. And it was said, no, we have to have national policies because this is just unfair and random. Um, and of course, it was based on the fact that local expertise had developed in certain areas. So the health services in the northeast had invented, invested in certain specialities because they have more local expertise there and they were trying to make the best use of their resources. And people in the southeast, had, um, you know, the professionals there had different expertise. But NICE, the National Institute for Health, um, for uh, care excellence, um, so clinical and healthcare excellence, um, was brought in in part to try to get rid of this notion of postcode prescribing and say that no, we decide centrally which um, facilities we want to make available and they're made available to everyone in the country, wherever they are, as a result of that. Now, of course, if you're still rationing, that still means there are some people who are going to be deprived of resources 
and then, and suffer. It just it just what it does it it gives you a picture of more consistency. But I'm wondering, does it actually make anything more fair? Because if I have a particular condition and I live in the southeast, I, I can't get treated for this. Am I reassured that even if I lived in the northeast, I still wouldn't be able to get treatment for this? <laughs> and of course, people who lived in the northeast who used to be able to get treatment for that condition and now they can't, are they going to rejoice in the overall consistency of the system? So there's still going to be some people who are made to suffer. It's just that the system is going to look much more consistent across the board. Now, so what are the distinctive features of this applied methodology? Um, OK, well, first of all, now this is the ve a very interesting quote from a writer called Dan Brock. I don't know if you, you, you guys know of Dan Brock's work, but he's very, quite famous uh, but bioethicist and you know, ethical philosopher. And he gives an account of his work on an ethics committee. And while I disagree with a lot of what he says, I really admire his contribution because he is such a candid account that he gives and such a frank account. Um, and but he, he says one of the things which philosophers need to understand then if they're going to give this kind of applied advice, the constraints of political reality, they need to avoid setting unrealistically wide agendas, which philosophers, he says, are tempted to do. So they need to be pragmatic. So again, hopefully you can all see this slides and stuff and let me know if you can't. Um, they need to give determinate answers to the questions. What should I do? Which decision is right or just in this situation? They also need to be realistic. Um, in that they need to give solutions that work given the world as it is. And Magelson et al, who I had the debate with in clinical ethics, they they make that point very clearly. There's no point giving a solution which says, well, oh, if only the world were completely different. If a health manager wants your advice on which services to cut, then you don't say, well, imagine a world in which you could fund all the services that were needed. You're not then giving him any advice at all, so they argue. Um, so. Applications in the COVID-19 pandemic. OK, well, we've seen calls for binding guidance on emergency rationing of critical care. So um, the, the commentators, uh, Coggan and Regmi, writing a, 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 a BMJ opinion piece, it was, um, they make this point very clearly. They say, this is quite recent, they say that binding guidance is important to give legal, legal protection for professionals, and so that the overall system can be perceived as just. And they quote um, some medical, legal and, and, and ethical um, contributors, uh, Thomas and colleagues, um, who say that in an open democratic society, we must confront these horrific questions, the ones presented us to by the pandemic, to reach specific answers we can all accept. And this is very much tied into the notion of liberal democracy and procedures and the idea, you know, idea of being open, that seems to be an important part of the of the ethic here. Um, now, they do note there are problems for this. Cognitive Regnum accept this and they quote uh, some authors, include this paper by Emmanuel S.L., my colleague, uh, an old comrade, um, Ross Upshaw was a co-author to that, but they, they note this um, Numerous contradictory approaches to prioritisation that can claim to be justice based, impartial and reasonable. So they say. Um, multiple values can reasonably cl be claimed to be based on you know, just justice based considerations, meaning ones supported by reasons that an impartial observer would agree are good reasons. But nonetheless, these numerous different systems can give rise to radically distinct answers. Hello, can you okay. still hear me? No, no, no. Yes. You can still hear and see me OK? Yes. OK, okay. right. I, I yes. lost sight of you for a minute. For some reason, I lost sight of you then. I started to get worried, but you can see me. Yeah, OK. I, um, all right. So. They notice that, you know, so doing the even when you do the reasoning process properly, you can get different answers and there's there's no obviously one clear, correct answer that you can give. And they s distinguish, therefore, between all accept and all agree. They seem to be saying we could all accept the outcomes of this process, 
Um, hang on, what's happened there? Oh, right, sorry, have you lost sight of the, yeah. We could all accept the, uh, yeah, the outcomes of a process, uh, even if we didn't all agree, even if some of us would have chosen the different routes. And they say what matters is that the system is seen to work as a coherent authoritative whole. So again, there's a very proceduralist kind of assumption going on there. And I wonder, you know, are they, what are they saying exactly about justice? Is justice simply perceived coherence? You know, because we know that some systems could be ta consistent, but unfair, couldn't they? You know, we can think, you know, we can think of all sorts of examples of that. Um, I agree that we need to, you know, I can understand why practitioners want legal protection, but can we not talk about there being special excuses in emergencies um, without that meaning that we want to set rational priorities? So you may just have to make certain arbitrary decisions about treating one group of patients than another, but do you really want to say that um, somehow we need to say that you know why do you want to say that one answer is definitively correct i mean if you need if you're you know think about a triage situation if you have to just if you've got five people who are all bleeding to death and you the, you start patching up the person nearest to you first and the person four people along dies you wouldn't want the practitioner to be prosecuted then but you don't do you really need to have a system which says what you know that which of those five needed prioritizing it might well be that they all have the right to life and you just did your best, you know. Um, so there are issues there, but they certainly feel that it's important to have an overall and transparent system. Now, the outcomes of this, again, is that is that OK? Is that still clear to people? Can people see it? Yeah, OK, so the outcomes of this deprioritization of the elderly. So certainly in Britain, the way these these systems have played out, um, there's been a lot of stuff in the newspapers about the scandal of the fact that basically care homes were completely ignored. When resources were needed, they were sent to the NHS. When tests were needed, they went to NHS hospitals. They, you know, the elderly, basically, the government clearly thought we'll leave them in the care homes and yes, a lot of them will die. We won't even measure how many of them died because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and there's been you know, a lot of sort of questions about that and the disabled. So the National Institute for Clinical Excellence was legally challenged by a disability rights group because of its frailty scale. There was a scale of one, one to ten and they seem to be saying that people would only get hospital treatment if they were between one and five and anyone above five wouldn't. And then this was argued to be, uh, well, people said these virus measures exacerbated systemic injustice. Um, so there's a BBC report on that, which I've put at the end of this transparency. Um, racial disparities, effects on the global poor and the dispossessed have all been, have all come up. We've seen that the, pa the pandemic, yes, guess what? Surprise, surprise, as ever, the people who are worse off anyway have been hit badly, have been, have had worse effects because, uh, due to this pandemic. Um, and of course, people with rare or expensive conditions. So you know, one story that I was looking at recently, coronavirus blocked a seven year old's cancer treatment. A little boy in the UK who was trying to get cancer treatment, um, he had a very rare condition. It was treatable in the, in the United States, but of course he couldn't go to the United States. Um, he went to, he was, you know, it could have been, in, under other circumstances, it could have been made available in the UK, but they weren't spending on it because of the pandemic. And, um, there was, you know, he was told he had, we had to try and have a big fund to collect him to get something privately. Um, and that was a distressing case. Now, I think that um, the bioethicists, Magelson and colleagues, might well think that my being so upset over that and giving a donation to that, so something about my irrational and sentimental approach, because they would argue that a general principle was being applied there, which was economically rational in the context of a pandemic. Um, and so we should see that as deeply unfortunate, but not a grotesque injustice. Um, OK, well, I, I mean, I, I, there's issues to explore there. Um, so, OK, Pro, I put up problems for applied ethics. Now, again, can people see that OK? Was that, was that coming up OK? Yeah. All right. OK, so problem. Problems for applied ethics in this sense. First of all, the contentious nature of the subject. So I've already alluded to that. You know, I've already made the point about, you know, um, different 
people, different philosophers can have radically different views, for instance, about what is the ethical solution in a particular situation. So is bringing in a philosopher as, for instance, to chair an ethics committee, is that really making philosophy affect the outcome? Because the views of that particular philosopher are surely going to be relevant, aren't they? Um, and I've noticed something called the theory and practice gap here. Um, and it just seems to me, and I get, I give an analogy with racing. So, I mean, we know, we all know about, you know, I mean, presumably, I don't know, in the rest of the world, it's not just the UK with people, there's certain people who misguided as they are, they go to watch horses racing. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a big betting culture in the UK, people bet on horses. Now, suppose that you found out that someone was a Newtonian physicist and you, you found out that there's such a thing as Newton's laws of motion. So you ask that Newtonian physicist, OK, can you tell me, I'm about to put a bet on a horse, can you tell me which horse is going to win the 3.30 at Doncaster this week, right? Now, the physicist probably couldn't tell you, right? Does that show that his so-called laws of motion and Newton's theory of motion is not practically applicable, in fact? All right. No, it doesn't. It just has different practical implications. It's about fundamental questions about the nature of motion. Now, it seems to me I want to argue that to assume that you can set up any situation you like, you know, the sort of thing that we get in applied ethics where you have, oh, you've got to kill this one person or whatever, you know, the trolley, the trolley, you know, the, the the, what, what's it, the, you know, the trolley cars example, you know, things like you've got to kill um, one person or another, or you can, any question you like, limit the choices available in any way you like, and then bring in Kantian or utilitarian or some other moral theory to provide a determinist answer to the question, so what should you do? Arguably, that's actually to abuse these moral theories. Surely they were designed to consider fundamental questions about the nature of moral thinking. And there's all sorts of other questions that have to come into practical decision making, but they weren't designed to rationalise any decision that you care to make or give you a determinist answer to literally any question that you care to frame. So is the usefulness of philosophy to be explained by providing the sort of answers that we can sometimes end up providing in applied ethics, um, telling the government which group of patients in the crisis we should uh, deprioritise, for instance. Um, now, there are issues about characterising the problem and the scope of the practical. Um, have I mean I haven't been I haven't been talking for too long now, have I? It's, uh, um, I can't, yeah, okay. Um, sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll return to this, so I'll skip this quickly for my just, but Kant isn't the problem of the scope, but this issue I've alluded to, how you frame problems and what your background assumptions are, and I'll give a specific example of this when I talk about my debate with the Norwegian philosophers, which I think is very interesting, their use of a particular example. Um, there are contentious questions about that, and there are limits to the context of reasoning. So we can't just make assumptions, can we, about the moral status of social roles and norms and say, well, this is what my, I have to do in my job. Sometimes my job might, ha might require me to do something that's unethical. Now, then there are big problems about what the hell I do about that. I accept it, but we can't just assume that our role is always to give to uh, employers and organisations and most often people who are holding research funding, which means the bosses, the managers or the politicians and give them theories and principles that show that the system that they preside over can be seen to be entirely ethical and just. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't have something called mafia henchman ethics, the ethics of slavery. You wouldn't have a book called Ethics and the Concentration Camp Guard because those, you, you would see straight away that those social roles were too questionable. So, yeah, it's one. Now, that's not to say that there aren't ethical distinctions that you can make. So with slavery, yes, yeah, some slavers were better and some were worse than others. You know, you were better to, you know, you, you know, you were not going to be raped and killed by this particular owner, but you would be by that other one, right? But it doesn't follow from that that you can have something called the ethics of slavery as a as a as a system that you could rationalise and say, well, look, this is how we must produce, you know, in you know, we're living in 17th century America or whatever. Now, this is how we must produce our crops by the use of slaves. So, what's the ethical way to do it? Because it's inherently unethical. There are better and worse slavers, but there's no such thing as an ethical way to own slaves. Um, so you have to be careful at least as to what you're doing when you give, you know, you know, we, you know the point, we are not the end of history. 
right? There may be certain systems and structures in our own society that if we're really to bring about progress, we want to focus on critiquing those, not on providing accounts of how they can be managed in as ethical a way as possible. Right? There are these political questions there, which of course people like Michael Carso can nicely just bracket off because he says, oh, that's not my area of expertise. I'm not an appropriate consultant for those political questions, only for these medical ethics questions. OK, um, so there are issues. Now, look, I'll try and get through this quickly. Um, so, as I said, my colleague Vila um, on bedside rationing, the paper of his that I referred to before, um, he says as a clinician, I think his paper is called, was it? Give the doctor what is due to the doctor, um, the impossibility of bedside rationing. Now, I think particularly what he's thinking about, and again, you know, as it, I don't know if your, your, your use of the term is, is the same or different, but he's thinking about cases where, yeah, we're not talking about some kind of you know, terrible sort of triage situation where suddenly 10 people are brought in or seriously injured. We're talking about when you're dealing with particular patients and there's different treatment options you could give them and there's certain that you feel sure are better for them and you've discussed it with them. But you have also heard that the budget in your area has been cut and the managers have told you you've got to be very careful. There are certain treatments and certain whole um, procedures that you don't want to embark on if you can possibly help it because they're too costly and we can't afford that at the moment. Um, now he says that it's not his role as a doctor to be involved in that kind of decision making and his, his primary duty isn't to make life as easy as possible for his manager. Um, so he says scarcity in health systems is a result of political decisions. It's not simply a given as the bioethicists he's critiquing seem to treat it. And he has the question, to whom is my primary duty? Um, and he puts forward something in defence and called the ethics of proximity. The doctor's primary duty is to the patient in front of me, he says, uh, as a caring, virtuous person, I must give my the best I can to this person whose suffering is, is before me right now. And he makes reference to the Good Samaritan parable. Um, where he said, you know, he talks about you know, the Good Samaritan didn't sort of stop and say, well, hang on a minute. I've just got to, you know, he couldn't have used a cell phone, but, you know, he just, he just I'll just phone my boss and see if there's any concerns in Palestine that need addressing more urgently than this man who's dying on the pavement in front of me. He helps the guy on the pavement in front of him. And Vila takes that view and says that rationing culture diminishes our sense of outrage at the injustice of depriving patients of needed resources. And of course, this sense of outrage we've seen in the recent, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests, how much, how important a sense of outrage can be to delivering social change. You know, there have been all sorts of stories of cases like the George Floyd incident, which have been reported widely, but seeing the video of it and the outrage that generated has been a major catalyst for change. And so arguably, you know, we, he, you know Vila thinks there's something bad about any culture that says, well, we just have to see certain things as necessary and unavoidable and accept them. It's gonna, you know, if we're saying to certain patients, you need this, but yeah, we haven't got the money, you can't have it. He's not, you know, he's not happy with that. OK, now before going, is that making sense so far? Is that OK? Yeah. OK, thanks. I think it's OK. OK. Uh, so I suppose people are, 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 are still with you in, in understanding. Can, okay. You can go on. OK, thanks. That's it. All right. Well, so. Now. I think Max and SL, they have a very interesting response to this, which I think reveals a lot about their their position, what their view of bioethics is. Um, they say, no, Vila is just wrong. Rationing is a necessity and he has to distinguish his role as a health professional from political debates about the overall health budget. So they say, you know, that they, they, they are interested. They might even support Vila in trying to convince the electorates and the politicians that healthcare funding must be increased dramatically. But in the meantime, they say he should support a uh, transparent priority setting based on public justified criteria and procedures. Um, and, so, and then he should abide by, he should see himself as part of that overall system. And therefore, even though this patient has a particular need, he knows he's not supposed to be prescribing this kind of treatment, so he should avoid doing so. And they say, a well-developed professional ethic ought to be able to incorporate and justify notions of justice and rationing. 
they then argue that the ethics of proximity is, as, as Vila explains, is, is unsuited to provide such an ethical framework for medicine. And for that reason, it is, by their view, refuted within the dialogue of bioethical discourse. Now, that's very interesting. That tells us a lot about that, their assumptions and you know, this notion of being realistic and pragmatic. No, they have a very specific view of what proper methodology is in the area of applied ethics. And it does mean that given the world as it is, you must be able to find just solutions to the problems you have, even when those solutions tell you this particular group of people must suffer or even die. Um, so that's it's interesting that they're very they are very clear and open. So again, you know, some praise to them for their you know, like with Brock for their, their incredible clarity there, it seems to be. Um, there's a view of methodology there. And they would say this in a resource, you know, well, the, the wonderful quote from Alan Williams, you know, the, uh, the, the economist who devised the quality and um, him and with Maynard, wasn't it? And um, he has this phrase in a resource constrained system, cost equals sacrifice. Um, and basically, he says, um, you know, if you take away from all systems of resource constraints, if you take away from one group of patients, you, you know, if you get so if you spend on one group of patients, you are taking away resources from another. That is inevitable. It is in, indeed a given. Um, now, Magelson and colleagues give a very interesting illustration, which I think they believe makes their point for them. So they talk about an example in Norway where there was a, a situation where Women have been protesting for a long while that the, the, the horrendous delays and deprivation in reconstructive surgery for breast cancer patients. Um, and they had had what uh, Magelson and colleagues call an emotive and heart wrenching campaign. Where the women that had demonstrations, they talked about the grief that caused them, they bared their scars at the demonstrations and been filmed doing so. And that had led the Norwegian um, health authorities the, the, the Department of Health in Norway to give way and spend more, more money on their surgery and they got the reconstructive surgery that they've been looking for for so long. But, Magnus and colleagues say, this had an unfortunate side effect, they note, in that the money was simply taken from the budget for surgery for children with cleft lip and palate. As a result of, and, you know, and they say that as a side effect there of this campaign, the children with cleft lip and palate suffered. And they say, surely sentimentality should be replaced by public transparent rationing procedures if we're making decisions of this sort. Now, I want to query this, obviously. What are their assumptions here? <laughs> First of all, they're assuming that being practical in this sense means that we must be able to give a non-arbitrary answer to any question of the form, what should I do? They certainly are assuming that very clearly, um, and I don't see why. So I gave this you know, I gave this example about, you know, suppose I went to a bioethics conference and I, I was told you must kill five of the attenders of this conference. Five of the bioethicists at the conference must be killed. You've got to choose them. Now, there are some moral questions that do admit of it. What's that? No, no, no. no. Yeah, I'm excluding no. from that. <laughs> yeah, okay, you are excluded because you're right. Now, suppose I just I draw up some criteria, right? Now, the point is, why should I be able to do that? If you give me a choice between saying you can either kill no one at the conference or five people, then there's a determinate answer. You ought not to kill anyone if you can avoid it, right? But if I, ha if you just tell me the way that the, the assumption is framed, you have to kill five people. Should there be any criteria for me to select the five? Should I be able to appeal to Kant to tell me which five or, or Bentham to tell which five? And you know what happens when you do? You straight away get into the sort of arguments that we've seen that came up with rationing generally and in the COVID case, the elderly and the disabled get targeted first. You say, oh, we'll bring in Alan Williams then. Oh, that guy looks really old. He's probably not got many life years ahead of him. Um, and then what, the disabled? So yes, we're saying things the disabled groups do get very angry about. We're saying, yes, your quality, your average quality life year is lower than that of a person we deem fully able. 
uh, and therefore we're going to deprioritize you. you know, why should there be any answer? If, if you really tell me that I've got to kill five people, mightn't it be, well, there's no right answer there. That's just, you, you don't start from it. That's not, a, you know, what I, if I can spend my time thinking and reasoning, I should be trying to think of a way out of having to kill anyone. You know, if it's because, you know, for instance, you know, you give me back, you know, some lunatic is going to blow up the entire conference unless I kill five people. Well, maybe I should spend my reasoning thinking how to outwit this lunatic rather than thinking of which five people I should kill. You know, how do we, what, how do we devote, what, what's the best way to devote our intellectual resources? So it seems to me there's no obvious reason why there has to be a non-arbitrary. If you say you have to kill Sally or Jane, and you say Sally is 28, Jane is 35, Sally has a slight disability of speaking, and Jane, you know, why should those criteria be give me any answer as to which one of them I should kill? I don't want to kill either of them. I want to live in a world where I'm not obliged to kill either of them. So now. The other, assumption, the other assumption that they make quite clearly is that the spending on patient group A causes the sacrifice of group B. They're very clear, it seems to me, they're, they're using the Alan Williams idea there, that the, um, the spending of, on the women uh, with breast cancer who are looking for reconstructive surgery, the spending on those patients caused the sacrifice of the children uh, with cleft palate, with cleft lip and palate. That seems what they're saying. Now, how, what's their reasoning there? It's a simple human reasoning that they're doing. They are basically saying um, that they're imagining that if, you know, they're imagining a counterfactual, they're saying if we had spent on, uh, if we had not spent on the women who were looking for reconstructive surgery, that money would have been spent on the children with cleft palate. Therefore, the spending on those women was what actually caused the suffering of children with cleft palate. And they also argue that ought implies can. Unavoidable suffering, then, for, is rejectable. Strictly speaking, it can't be unjust, because if we said a system was unjust, we'd have to say we've got to fight to overturn that system. Same with, sla that's with slavery, it's the same, right? Ultimately, slavery is inherently unjust. So while some slavers can be better or worse, nonetheless, job number one is how do we end slavery? And so if we really think, say that the economic system makes certain injustices inevitable, then that means the economic system is unjust and is changing. So we avoid saying that. We say it's deeply, deeply regrettable, but we don't say it's unjust because all implies can. If you really can't spend on both groups of patients, then you can't really say that you ought to. That's their argument. And that's why Vila, on their view, is being impractical. Now, Obviously, you know, I, I, I agree with Vila, I don't agree with them. My, so my response to this, I want to examine their use of counterfactuals regarding necessity and causal reasoning. Um, and in particular, you know, their remit determines their accounts of each. So in that example that they give, right, let's say what's happened there is, right, the politicians in question have been quite happily planning to never spend on the women who were looking for reconstructive surgery. They were not, they, 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 but those women made a noise. They were bolshy. They made a noise and they got the spending. Now, instead of the politicians saying, oh, OK, then, well, let's look at the rest of the economy then. Um, so, you know, should we close, you know, should we increase the overall health budget to fund both groups and maybe charge a little more in taxes to super rich, to large corporations, uh, cut spending on armaments, perhaps cut spending on our own salaries and perks or indeed the inflated salaries of game show hosts and other celebrities? Should we do it? No, they didn't do any of that. They just looked at the health budget, left everything else as it was and cut the money. Now, so in terms of what caused the suffering of those children with cleft palace, how is one notion of causal reasoning better than any other? Suppose I imagine a counterfactual situation in which they increase the overall health budget and increase the taxes on the programme Norway's Got Talent by 15%. If I use that counterfactual as the basis for my Humean causal reasoning, can't I then say, well, it was the it was the um, the profits of Norway's Got Talent that caused the suffering of the children with cleft lip palace? Why blame the women who bravely campaigned to get their conditions treated? Why say they were the cause of what happened to those children? Why you know why limit your counterfactual reasoning to there? 
Well, the reason is because you're a bioethicist and that's the assumed remit of your accounts. But how is that? Why is that a non-arbitrary remit? Why should a clinician such as Vila accept that remit? So there's a distinction between the system as a starting point for your thinking, as they seem to take it, and as an arbitrary barrier to practical moral thinking. And Vila clearly takes it as the second point. And so I say Vila is a, you know, is a nice illustration of that quote. Um, you know, you know, do you know George Bernard Shaw's quote on the reasonable and the unreasonable man? Shaw says, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. You know, I'm saying, you know, maybe we need more clinicians like Vila, right? Not less. Instead of saying, oh, OK, OK, we won't make a fuss about this. Um, well, right, you know, uh, it's not my, no, you know, I'm, uh, when I'm off work, I'll think about this. But while I'm in work, I'll implement. Maybe we need some people to shout more. You know, um, you know, uh, but anyway, th so there's there's different approaches here, anyways, I'll say. And so I will I'll quickly sort of try to summarise this. Um, so pragmatism and realism in the sense outlined, right? Now, again, that's why I think Brock's pieces, Brock's account of his work as the chair, of, he was, it was a government ethics committee, sat on, I think it was years ago during the Clinton administration. And basically Brock was, it was to do, he was asked to comment on end of life ethics. And he says, Academic discourse is to persuade other scholars by argument and evidence in the common in the common search for the truth. That's what you're doing in academic discourses. But your methodology when you move into these practical areas has got to change. In policy discourse, he says it's all about persuading or manipulating others to reach a desired outcome. To challenge certain fundamental ideas would be to use up your credibility. Now, Brock and Brock said he gives a very interesting and frank account of this in his own um, description. So he basically, his view is that there is no credible distinction between killing and letting die. There is no intellectually tenable distinction between those two things. Right? That's his view, which he's argued very well. Um, but he knew that on the committee, if he said that, he would lose up his credibility. So instead, the forms of euthanasia or assisted suicide that he wanted to get past, he argued that they could be characterised as letting die, not killing. Right. So basically, he, as he says, he had to learn to abandon his academic ways to make a difference to the committee. He didn't believe he argued for what was he thought was an untenable distinction because that was the best way to get certain forms of assisted suicide legalized in America at that time, which is what he wanted to do. Right. So. What I say to that is, OK, Brock did something which, if we accept his arguments, we might agree he did a good thing if he helped out some people who were suffering dreadfully. Um, some will disagree, of course. But what are the criteria for the selection of advisors and also the criteria for the issues on which advice is sought? Right. Brock says that despite having acknowledged this, he still thinks that his role as a philosopher was important and in some way helped. Was it, was it, was it you know, move on or moved forward the discussion? Right. Now, how exactly? Did he, as I say, did he move forward the discussion in precisely the same way that, say, the ultra conservative philosopher Roger Scruton would have moved it forward? Scruton sure as hell wouldn't have been arguing for what Brock was arguing for there in terms of, you know, liberalising their laws on assisted dying, basically quite the reverse. He'd be saying arrest practitioners who have assisted anyone in dying and lock them up for 25 years uh, or maybe even execute them. Um, so what is, so that seems to me to illustrate who is selected to advise and on what issues? I mean, Dan Brock surely is not naive at all. So he would surely realise that when a subsequent American regime decided to go to war with Iraq, they didn't think first to ask the advice of a narco Marxist philosopher, uh, Robert Wolf, did they? Right. They didn't say, let's set up an, an ethics committee and put Robert on this and ask about the ethics of warfare. Because, yeah, <laughs> of course not. He, they were, he would have given them disastrous answers from their perspective. So um, what really determines the outcomes of these things? Is it philosophers and philosophy or is it um, the decisions of policymakers as to how they use these people? So here's what I see is the danger of this approach to ethics. All right. The involvement of academics, as I argued years ago, can 
help foster the illusion that fundamentally arbitrary decisions are grounded in objective or impartial reasoning. All right. So basically their role can be to bestow intellectual credibility on the process, making it subsequently harder for others affected by the process, but lacking academic standing to criticize the policy. So people in, so in the workforce, for instance, so the, the risk is, as I say, that the, the work of the favoured academics becomes another stick in the already impressive armoury of the powerful, sometimes to beat down the workforce. Um, so, you know, in, the, in just the same way that the church in earlier times, you know, in, prior to the emergence of the Enlightenment era and liberal secular democracies, the church there, it, it performed a function where it said, oh, this Christ, yeah, he did sound like a pacifist, but nonetheless, our recent attacks on the Dutch, he totally approved of them, right? And they would tell the governments that, and that would help give the populace a reason to support them. Now, it seems to me, similarly, we are giving a sense of, in a secular uh, liberal society of there being rational processes that determine these decisions when in our own accounts of what we actually did on the committee we admit the decisions were arbitrary and we abandoned our academic ways so Brock's on that just committee as a philosopher but he admits that philosophical methodology is the first thing he had to abandon to make any difference to the committee members to not use up his credibility so the concern I have with that is that you know it's not necessarily fulfilling the role that the ethicists think it is uh, or, or, or you know, say it is. So Bernard Shaw is a, on the unreasonable man, you know, do we want to change, you know, do, you know, do we want to insist as a, you know, pro, does, pro, doesn't progress depend on the unreasonable man? We don't want to adapt ourselves to the world, but rather to try and adapt the world to our, our, our arguments. And it seems to me the role of academics is to challenge boundaries and, you know, the COVID-19 crisis is an artificial is an illustration of the artificiality of certain boundaries. Um, you know that you know. So what I worry that what we should we should be taking out of the two approaches anyway. I give an argument for the one of broadening rather than narrowing. You know, it seems to me I would go with the Socratic idea that you ask the difficult questions, you get you get into dialogue, and progress can dialogue can lead to progress sometimes certainly, uh, but that it's is it our role necessarily to give people answers. You know uh, that notion of focusing and apply is at least has problems and it's at least worth being aware of those problems and the risks of them i mean i realize that's not you know there's all sorts of arguments against me you know as, as, as other people have said to me since about the book years ago so are you saying that you should never sit on an ethics committee for instance and if you're not saying that michael what are you saying i think there were good questions there about how what pragmatically we do with these arguments but nonetheless they're worth considering it seems to me so I don't know, I, maybe I should just leave it there because I think, you know, I've talked for at least an hour there, haven't I? Even though I've got online. So does that seem, does that make sense and seem OK? And do I need to do something to unshare my screen? I mean, on that, on the thing I put up, there's like, there's references which people can look at, which, you know, have the thing on. But if I take that off. OK. If I, oh, I tried to take it off and it hasn't gone. Oh, has it now? Right, but then I need to do this is so share. Oh, share desktop. No, now you now. Is it shared now still? You or stop not? It, yeah, you stop it the, to share the present. But that, it's not necessary to share again or are you trying to share? No, is that OK, no, I was trying to unshare it so that we could just go back to the normal. Is that is that unshared now or not? No, it's not. It's nothing shared now. OK, uh, all right. OK, this is OK. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. And uh, I think we can uh, 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 organize the discussion. And uh, uh, before uh, uh, passing uh, the word to Marcelo uh, de Araujo, uh, I have to say that and when, and when I read your summary, uh, you you sent to me and and I passed to some orders. I I felt myself uh, with my ear pinched because uh, it seemed to me that you are saying that you are criticizing things that I do, and right. uh, this is but this is good. No problem. This is good. This make us think about what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I know several things you wrote. And uh, I can uh, talk about some of them uh, after. 
uh, I understand your 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 kind, and uh, this is interesting. It was a broad presentation, uh, several issues to discuss, but now I I I have not. Uh, I I must to to stop uh, talking and and pass the the word to Marcelo de Araujo that we uh, chose to discuss and comment your presentation, and then. Uh, I read some uh, some questions of the uh, participants, and some of them are very interesting. And then uh, after Marcelo, uh, I can read them to you and sure. and, and and discuss. Uh, so now, uh, Marcelo de Araujo is a professor in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he's philosopher and teaches at the uh, State University of Rio de Janeiro and the federal. University of Rio de Janeiro, and he is also a researcher from the or national agency, the CNPq, and the National Council of uh, Researchers. And uh, his, uh, or he was uh, at Huahiro as a researcher uh, uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and the same year, one of was in the same year I were, I, I, I were, and uh, we discussed it a lot of. Uh, times and and drank some uh, couples uh, <laughs> cups of wine mm. and uh, Marcelo is a friend of mine, a friend of some of us. But uh, yeah, as you will see, uh, he's a uh, uh, very smart and 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 uh, uh, intelligent uh, uh, philosopher. So uh, and elegant too. Uh, he always uh, use a tie. And, uh, and, and <laughs> so, Marcelo, uh, uh, you can. Thank uh, you, Marco. Uh, your I must start by saying I'm not that smart because I forgot to charge my computer. Uh, you're going to do it now. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. No problem. Uh, we wait. <laughs> uh. Are you hanging up? <laughs> what are you trying to do <laughs> with this? I think, I think it's a good work. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the invitation. And thank you, Michael, for your talk. I, I did enjoy your talk. There are so many topics you have addressed. I'm not quite sure if I followed every step of your talk. Um, sometimes I was not sure if you were reporting some of the views of uh, bioethicists of if you are endorsing them or trying to to refute them. Um, firstly, I should say uh, right at the beginning, that's a, I think it's a good idea, the assumption that horrific events, that, that these were your words, uh, might precipitate a great change. And I think it's what's happening now. Uh, people are speaking, uh, thinking again about uh, environment and the environment crisis yet now. And uh, the question is, uh, the question, uh, uh, my uh, doubt is to which extent uh, we should be uh, optimists about, about the change that are to come now. On the one hand, it's well possible that people will be more concerned about, for example, about the environment after this crisis now, but on the other hand, maybe the states will be so um, eager to recover the economy that, for example, environmental issues may be, may be perceived as a, a less important topic in the future, especially um, one th point I have in mind here is that all of a sudden, in just a couple of months, we have seen now uh, curfew in many countries, restriction of liberties and so on. It, it was such a huge change in such a, a just a, a couple of months. And people were willing to endure all this sacrifice now because they were going to suffer if they wouldn't, wouldn't do it. On the other hand, when you think about the climate crisis, uh, you have mentioned at the beginning the environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. And we see that people are quite um, inert. People are quite um, ineffective in applying measures to avert, avert 
um, climate change, because it's going to happen in the future. So I, I wouldn't be that optimistic now because people are willing to endorse these drastic measures when they themselves are going to suffer. And on the other hand, when we think about what's, what's going to happen in the future, if we don't stop climate change, for example, it can be much, much worse than, what, than the, the current global crisis. But on the other hand, it's, people are not doing much in order to stop global crisis. So the question is, uh, if you really believe it, if there is any sign right now that uh, these horrific events right now are going to precipitate some kind of radical change. I would be rather skeptical about this. Um, there are also other topics. I think one topic that uh, you mentioned more than once uh, was about the role of uh, philosophers in committees of bioethics. And I had the impression, you may correct me now, we were quite skeptical about the, the, the role philosophers may play in this, uh, these committees. Um, one thing you said about uh, the, the, the participation of philosophers in committees was about, well, there's, there are so many different positions in philosophy and people, philosophers, it's the nature of our jobs that we are not never agree with one another. And this kind of disagreement is going to appear again in the community. So in the end, um, it's just one philosopher trying. To, this is what I have understood from your point. In the end, it will be one philosopher trying to to push his own position onto a committee. I was the question was uh, that uh, occurred to me is was that it, whether it is what is it what to expect from a philosopher in a position like this? Uh, maybe the philosopher is not someone who is trying to. Of course, he or she will have his or her own position. Maybe can going to to endorse. Uh, Kantian position or utilitarianism and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, I think philosophers might be far more important in these situations um, because they perhaps are able to see the point of an argument or to maybe some positions which are uh, defended by other, by other persons in a committee are sometimes naive or or simply it may be a naive endorsement of natural law ideas and so forth. The philosopher maybe is one who is going to call attention to, to the flaws in the arguments, not so much what someone who's going to simply to, to press his or her, or her own position. And for this reason, I think it's important to have philosophers in this uh, committees mm -hmm. and I understand uh, Marcus' concern about some of the points you have addressed here, Marco and uh, uh, two other colleagues. I think they are on the call to Dahle Dallagnol and Alcino Bonella for some time now since the outbreak of the pandemic, it was Marcus' initiative that we should be, we should st start a, a conversation on these topics, um, and uh, we exchanged a lot of messages. And the output up to now has been uh, three or how many <laughs> articles, Mark? I can't remember. I think we have published two page two. To says uh, on in the in the press about rationing, uh, what should be the best criteria? From what I have understood from your talk, you wouldn't agree <laughs> with our topics. You have been um, defending. Maybe Mark would help me to summarize what we have been defending. But it's clearly, uh, for example, an attempt to to show that in this particular situation now during the crisis in in to be 
to be in accord with what you have uh, suggested at the beginning of your talk. If you first we do no harm, and so, uh, sometimes the most important thing is not simply not to do harm, but to avoid the worst outcome. And this is, I think, the situation we are now, especially in Brazil, when so many hospitals are on the brink of collapsing. And we have to have some kind of a criteria to decide who is going to be admitted, admitted to special care and who is not going to be admitted. And one of the things we have suggested was that um, we didn't say clearly it was the criteria of age. What we said, uh, the most important criteria should be um, um, saving the, 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 the most, uh, the greatest number of years of life. Uh, it didn't mean automatically that we're going to reject uh, the elderly for treatment. Uh, the elderly in some situations should have priority if someone else who is younger do not have the same prospect of surviving the, 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 the disease. So it was not exactly about age, but one reaction we uh, we had from our colleagues and in the press too was that it was clearly an arbitrary uh, attempt to exa exacerbate some already existing inequalities in Brazil. And I think this is one of the topics to have you addressed. Uh, maybe we don't have in Brazil uh, lots and lots of immigrants as you have in the UK. Uh, but we do have, uh, it's a matter of fact that more uh, black people are dying in the hospitals now that may not black peoples. But one of the impressions we had uh, after we have published these this, this two short essays is that people were trying to deploy their moral intuitions, which do work, which are meaningful in, so to speak, a, a, a normal context. And, and they were trying to, for example, to preserve the idea that in the context of the pandemic, the principle of a first come, first served should be followed. And one impression we had was that um, people didn't realize that we had to have a criteria, of course, um, the the context in which the criteria had to be has to be uh, applied is already unjust. There has been so much inequality in Brazil, so much injustice, yeah. and uh, one impression I had is that people f were thinking that the 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 criteria for receiving treatment would be a means to address previous injustice. And this is exactly what Marco and our two other colleagues were trying to avoid. This is not the, this is not the proper tool to address prop, uh, previous injustice. Uh, in other contexts, we can apply and we should really struggle and fight for uh, economic equality or justice at large. But in this particular moment we are living now, maybe the, the criteria is not the proper tool to, to address previous injustice. And when you mentioned the idea of ethics of proximity, I assume you were trying to repel the idea, not to endorse. Well, that's Vila's position. Um, he argues for that and he uses the Good Samaritan as his example. I, so I wasn't, I was, I am interested in what he has to say. And what I like about Vila's position is the kind of, I mean, I've got, I can say more a bit about my own position, but his, um, his use of intuition, uh, you know, his Aristotelianism, it seems to me, because it, the, the, his ethics of proximity, it's a mixture of Aristotle and Levinas that he uses to defend that. And basically, 
there is, you know, to my, yeah, you know, th there are problems with two, you know, principalism has a deep seated problem. Uh, really, we are trying to act as ethical agents in particular contexts, and it's going to be very hard to find any universally applicable principle as to how you should treat patient X. Uh, so there are fundamental differences required between the dialogue of legislation where you need those kind of broad criteria and the problem of living your life as an ethical person where you're going to have to be thinking in a different way and adapting to context. And as Aristotle says, it's this thing, you know, what's it? The, 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 the trick of life is preserving your integrity in the context of uh, different contexts that are always tending to corrupt it. Keeping yourself together as a moral being in a world which is going to naturally try and pull you apart. And those are balances that we have in life. It seems to me, and if we're honest about ethics, we have to accept that. But when you're writing for, you know, to give an answer to a, 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 an ethics committee, you are going to have to legislate in what is in fact a quasi legal way. And so what you're not going to be doing is ethics as Vila understands it. And ethics is, I, I, I'm sympathetic. While I wouldn't entirely go along with his position, I have some, some sympathies, some strong sympathies with it. I see where he's coming from. Okay, well, I was just thinking that this idea of ethics of proximity can give rise to so much injustice. Well, mm. firstly, because proximity relative to what? Uh, spatial, spatial proximity, uh, proximity in the sense of co-nationals or proximity in time. If there is proximity in time, this has a real huge implication for climate ethics. Because if uh, you understand the idea of a proximity in temporal terms, it means that we should prioritize now uh, our benefit now, that is in the next 10, 20 years. And we shouldn't uh, care much about what's going to happen on our planet over the next 50 or 100 years because it's so far away in the future that should be the object of concern and i think this point has already been addressed by ramsey and sid week and rose that proximity in time yeah. is no excuse for not taking into consideration the interests of people who are going to live in the future Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, that's that's yeah, certainly. I mean, I mean, I'm not, not disagreeing with you there, but yeah, that's what yeah, you've got to you've got to say a lot more. The term ethics of proximity obviously is open to a lot of interrogations to what precisely he means. Um, and he's looking you know, in, in the context that he's discussing. But, you know, that that's where in terms of being an ethical individual, um, you know, I, I am taking a broad, a kind of Aristotelian approach okay. here. And what you know, being a virtuous individual, of course, it does to my mind, it, it is important that you know his notion that he, he is saying as, as a doctor, he's going to care for his particular patients. And if that puts stresses on the system, he's reasoned that through to the extent that he thinks, well, maybe that's because the system needs to have these stresses put on it. And I think one of the things you have to do is distinguish between principles and tactics or strategies in situations. Right. Yeah. And I think you know, that that's going to be important in terms of how in terms of some of the questions that have been leveled at me about would I ever go on an ethics committee? Well, I mean, I won't interrupt. I know you probably want to say more. So maybe I sh should I wait until you finish with the point you're making before. Coming back no, no, this? please do go ahead. I should stress again, I did enjoy your talk. I truly regret I haven't been able to read your text in advance. I, I didn't get it. If I might possibly read your text, would love to. And um, maybe Marco might add something I have failed to mention about our joint project in addressing the, the situation now, but yes, please, I would, I would okay. like to, yes. No, it's, uh, your discussion is uh, is very interesting, and, but now uh, we, we, we could continue in discussing. Uh, right. Uh, right. Michael's uh, points, and uh, maybe I can uh, present some questions of the participants too. Yes. Uh, let me. Yeah. Let me. You 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 want to 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 say something more about uh, Marcelo says now, or or can I uh, make you the questions? Uh, one of the questions uh, of the uh, the participants. Now? Okay. Can OK, I? there's a lot that uh, could be said there. I mean, uh, d he was asking about my overall approach. 
and, yes. and you know what we think philosophy, philosophy is and philosophical methodology and there is more there's the book that Vila was referring to which I think I've put on my list but you can get that apparently for free on the internet now um, I haven't looked at that what's that what's it called? academia edu I haven't updated that page in about seven years right but apparently you can just download a copy of the book from there it's that it's got me at the wrong institution and the wrong job and everything because I just haven't managed to update it but the book that came out years ago is there now I try to argue there I say you know in terms of applied philosophy the question we have to ask is who is my audience right is it other academics because then you can have all sorts of debates is it um politicians and the powerful which is what certain people certain people like Dan Brock were thinking of when they wrote their stuff or is it anyone smart enough and decent enough to be interested and to care in the issues at hand. And for most of the time, applied philosophy should be aiming at those people and they will be members of the workforce. They may be patients, they may be practitioners. Now, the thing is, um, I characterise the notion of philosophy as basically training in intellectual and moral self-defence. So your point about environmentalism, yes, as an ethical individual, I do have to care for the person in front of me and I do have to think about others. And so you talked about, you know, I know with your stuff, at the, the rationing in Brazil, I'm getting a lot of stuff from this, the Amazon watch people about the treatment of indigenous people and how the way this regime in particular has targeted them and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, now that's an issue which, you know, for you is nearer and, you know, so, I, but that wouldn't be sensible for me to sanctimoniously stand there and somehow tick you off in particular and say as if you were particularly to blame for this when that I can I can take a role in this as well I can take an interest in this as well you know and I, I so in terms of modeling our notion of you know this notion of intellectual moral self-defense why I think it's an important thing for philosophy is what we need to do is we need to think about real change comes about not because this particular politician thinks it should right because when they are thinking they are not making their decision in terms of the sort of criteria that we would want them to be. You know, and I think the examples I've given of Brock and Co is a, make that point very nicely. He knows that. He knows that the, the politicians won't be influenced by strong arguments. But nonetheless, public debate moves forward because you get engaged populations who are interested in things. And when you look at all the major social progress, you know, you've got to take a sort some to some extent, you've got to take on board certain insights from Marx. But, you know, you need mass movements to change things. And, you know, your initial question about do we want to be optimistic now? The, the correct answer is it depends. It's up to us now. That's why I'm involved with all these different non-government organisations and campaigning groups. It's up to us now to argue the case that if we just resign ourselves, to this, if we let this time go past and we don't make any major changes to the way we do business, to the way in which we feed ourselves, incidentally, that seems to me to be extremely important to the future. And there are things that a lot of people don't want to think about, you know, particularly you know, about the way the way that we feed ourselves as a species that is going to affect our health in the future. And you look at the, the terrible things that are happening with the possible resurgence of it back in China at the moment, because guess and guess what? Guess where it was? The wet markets. What a surprise. We haven't closed them down and now we're starting to see the infection starting again, having eliminated them. There are all sorts of questions about how we do business generally that we're going to have to face. And it's not going to be you or me as an individual. It's going to be big movements. And the, the contribution as philosophers we can make to it is to try to make the arguments better and to think about who our audience is and to speak to the people that you know we want to speak to. And it's not just going to be politicians and the powerful. You know, and I go with Shaw, you know, about this thing, you know, there's the other point, I've quoted him on the reasonable man, the only, but also what's that thing he says about associating yourself with the movement for progress, right? That what you have to do is think about what is going to be progress now and associate yourself with that. And so as a general principle, there's only there's, there's certain things you can say, but a lot of it is tactics. And your point about are you guys bad guys? For do, it, not necessarily. But it depends, you have to think about why you do it, right? And so I must confess here, despite my criticisms of ethics committees, I sat at one point on a university ethics committee, right? And this was because the head of department there, when we were told we had to set up a research ethics committee, and my head of department said, Michael, you're the obvious person. You've written loads on this subject. Go with it. You're the man. We want you. And I said, John, is there not a certain irony in someone whose publications you're referring to are all criticising the very idea of ethics committees? And he's brought <laughs> for that by being made the chair of the ethics committee. To which John responded, 
All right, mate, he said. Fair enough. You don't want it. He said, I can think of plenty of other people who would want it. Certain other people who love that role. Do you know what I mean? They love the role. Well, I, mean, I thought, oh, yes. There were certain kinds of, yes, they would love to be able to have that level of control over their colleagues to make it almost impossible for them to get their research proposed for anything. And I thought, OK, John. I'll be the head of the ethics committee. Now, I would regard that, you see, as now I don't think that means that because I'm head of the committee, I speak with a certain moral authority I didn't have. We have to think about, you know, the political issues here. You know, that's power, right? And I chose in that situation to accept a certain amount of power as a tactic, you know, for the good old fashioned reason that the platonic philosopher Kings did, because if it wasn't me, it would have been someone else who would have actually wanted the job and would have made life hell for many of my colleagues. So I yeah. took it. Back. So there's issues of tactics and issues of principles, and it's how we defend them and where we defend them. But the worry I have is that what we have to be careful not to do is to perpetuate some of this. You know, the book I referred to is called Ethics Management and Mythology. What we don't want to do is to perpetuate contemporary mythology and say, yes, we are the ethical experts. As certain organisations will say, our reasoning was informed by ethical expertise. And so that somehow substitutes for argument that our, our committee decision is more authoritative than the legitimate grievances on the ground of members of the workforce who say, when you have to implement this, it's bloody horrible, actually. Have you any idea? You know, so we need to be careful as to what role we're playing and why. And those issues are largely tactical rather than issues of philosophical principle, it seems to me. Mm. Well, uh, Marcelo, something more or uh, can I try to pick some questions to to both of you? Right. Uh, because <clears throat> because we have some questions from the participants, but uh, they are different in content and uh, some of them are directly about uh, or focused in the rationing uh, discussion and uh, not exactly in your uh, uh, approach about the rationing uh, debate. But uh, maybe I can pre uh, present uh, first to you, uh, since uh, including Marcelo says that we, uh, we, we uh, 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 Marcelo says that I uh, uh, have the initiative to create a group with Marcelo, Alcino, uh, Bonella and Darley Dallagnol and we are discussing uh, about several issues and Marcelo says we already published uh, some papers about rationing in epidemic and pandemic and and uh, we uh, and act actually about uh, the discussion of uh, the medication the chloroquine and droxychloroquine and the problem of research uh, but we, we can discuss uh, something about that but uh, let me uh, pick some questions about the issue of rationing uh, uh, one of the participants says uh, i i read uh, we recently had a case in which a doctor had to choose between two ICU patients to receive the respirator and he made the quick choice according to his medical reading. Unfortunately, both patients died, the one who, rec re uh, who received help and the one who did not. Uh, the participants and so say not blaming the doctor, but wouldn't it be more ethical and technical if other elements could be considered in this immediate choice about who will receive the resource and can save their lives, that is, should the one call team participate with him in this choice? Uh, this is one question. Uh, question. What does that mean? So should the what participate in the choice? Yes, it is. Yes, uh, that it should the one call team participate with him in this choice. I think his uh, uh, question about uh, the decision that the doctor uh, made uh, isolately, I think. This is what I understood of the, the question. Uh, not blaming the doctor, he says, uh, he decided uh, who between two patients uh, mm -hmm. would receive the respirator and, and so he says, wouldn't it be more ethical and technical if other elements could be considered in this immediate choice 
uh, and that uh, should the on-call team participate with him in this choice. I think he's uh, uh, asking us questions about the, the decision and uh, sharing the decisions with not only patients, but the team and uh, the problem of responsibility in making choice and uh, in, the, in the pandemic we can understand that uh, some choice made by doctors are uh, in circumstance of emergency they are quick in this sense we have to do something we have to decide and uh, the uh, one problem with, uh, in this discussion is that uh, doctors feel themselves uh, very uh, uh, anxious and uh, and it's 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 a, they are in a predicament uh, and so uh, some people uh, as, as such as uh, think that we can uh, help them uh, offering uh, principles uh, uh, and guidelines and ideas etc and I, I think you uh, made some critical questions about that uh, but the, what Antonio here, uh, this is the participant, says is, uh, is about the circumstance of a doctor uh, deciding uh, 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 isolatedly uh, uh, without uh, uh, other participants. This is what I understood. Mm. I, know, I don't say if you want to make comments about that. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I can you talk something? But uh, the, uh, there is another question uh, from Alcino Bonella. Uh, Alcino says uh, many rationing protocols from for ICU includes uh, the principles of saving more lives and uh, uh, guideline li uh, such as using scores like uh, SOFA uh, uh, and others. Uh, if you are right, says Alcino. This could be working to reinforcing injustice and to cause harms against poor and disabled, frailty and Ill elders. Uh, one, is this really true? Says him, ask him. Uh, I mean, factually true that to try to save the majority will harm the poor. Uh, if true, uh, is not this side effect a social one, a social justice claim or a social utility claim, but health professionals in general ought to use medical uh, utility, says him, uh, not social utility and do not do social justly directly with medical institutions. And third, uh, uh, which is your solution or proposal to address this side effect, for example, on ICU challenge. So, so, so I don't know, do, do, do you want other clients to come in or should I come in on these? Uh, actually, there are three. Uh, one is if it is true okay. that uh, uh, if you are, uh, b b b first, uh, if uh, it, uh, his, his, uh, his, re uh, his inference is that if you are right, uh, uh, we, for example, acting as <laughs> ethics experts could be working to reinforce injustice. This is your uh, one question is, this is your view. Uh, and the other is, uh, if true, uh, this is not a side effect, uh, uh, a social one, uh, because health professionals in general ought to use medical utility but not says him social utility and do not do social social justice directly with medical institutions that is uh, it is not our job uh, to do social justice in these occasions of using uh, guidelines or principles uh, uh, in order to help people uh, mm -hmm. to sort out or to ration uh, to prior to prioritize, for example, uh, resource. Uh, I think this is the question. Hmm. So, I, I, OK, I'm not sure I'm completely guessing that, but um, there's a lot that needs to be said there about, I mean, the distinction, you know, you talk the first case about choosing between two patients. Now, I think certainly 
one thing we need to be clear about, you know, as philosophers, we need to reflect our own methodology and we need to have some time to do that, right? And so when we're talking to each other, we can give honest answers. There are questions about the ethics of giving an honest answer, right? Sometimes you don't necessarily want to give honest answers. So I could understand um, if it were the case, um, I, I, you know, if the, the situation where I, which I went to, if I, it, where I ended up taking on this role as head of the ethics committee. Now, if the management wanted to make bogus claims about that ethics committee uh, and how it gave an authoritative position, well, I'd have to see, you know, there'd be tactical questions as to when I was to, wanted to challenge some of those falsities and when I didn't. But they are tactical questions, not questions of principle. And my feeling is that with a lot of these ethical issues, so you talk about this person talking about choosing between two patients and who should decide and when. The answer, if we're honest, is frequently going to be one that wouldn't do if we were writing a policy document because it's going to be it depends and it depends on all manner of things. So, you know, if, if, when you look at some of your your like your, your exams in applied ethics, which are based on your, you know, your trolley problem and your, you know, who do you save in the lifeboat? Right. If there's three people over there and one person over there, who do you say? It depends on all sorts of things um, and it depends, for instance, if I if there were five young people um, in one of in one boat and you know an elderly woman in the other but the five young people were all members of the england defense league who just decided who had just been beating up some european immigrants in crew before coming on this voyage and the one elderly person was mother teresa i would go save mother teresa right and i would do that and be quite happy to make that choice as an individual because i think you know i would feel better about doing that because she's you know even if she's only got five more years left of her life she's still going to probably do more good in the world and she's going to do less harm than those people who you know now um basically i couldn't give you couldn't form a principle for a you couldn't have a principle of who you should save in the lifeboat because there'd be so many contingencies in that situation now of course if you're setting up principles for who should make decisions there are all sorts of political and social factors that you need to consider about what's my situation who do i want on this committee and your background to that is going to be what causes do i believe in what do i see as the progressive way to be and you're going to try and find the best arguments you can in practice to move the situation forward Right. So you might well want committees that have more professionals involved in making certain decisions than others. You might it, you know, you need to look at the practice of that situation. That case that was described, what were the what were the parameters of that? How long did the doctor have to make the decision? How, what sort of, you know, we need to know we need to know all sorts of facts about that before we could comment sensibly on whether or not other people could meaningfully and helpfully have been involved. There might be a good there might be a good answer you can give to it, but there isn't a generic answer that one can give as a philosopher to this. That would seem to me to be a mistake and not understanding the value of philosophy. You no, know, it will be true. Yeah. Hmm. Might I ask something about this, <laughs> that stuff? In, in saving, for example, uh, Madre Teresa, it hmm. seems you are uh, implicitly endorsing a kind of act utilitarianism. Every time you have to, to act, you pose all the questions again. Uh, in that particular situation, you are going to save a person who is older, but in that older situation, you are going to, to, to adopt a, a different pattern of decision. But for the public, when uh, we, we are thinking about public policy and transparency, mm -hmm. it's very hard to explain to the public either the physician in that particular situation is going to take every uh, particular point into consideration it doesn't help much to the purpose of um, organizing uh, our health system in a moment of crisis mm. and we have to decide upon a very restrict uh, uh, set of principles maybe these principles principles are indeed as you have suggested in your talk are quite arbitrary why the uh, to, to exclude uh, why, for example, to decide that if someone is 70 years old, he's be, he'll be, he or she'll be denied treatment and so on. This is mm. clearly arbitrary. But uh, on the other hand, for the public, it's easier to understand that some kind of a criteria is going to be adopted. And also for the physicians, will be the, you cannot possibly expect them 
every time to repeat all this procedure uh, to 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 ask the patient or the patient to be about his or her past his childhood so, and so on it would be it make life important treatment impossible triage impossible and it would be um, a, a, a further burden for the physician so even in laboratory it's more ethical to have a kind of a, a very limited kind of uh, principles which is not so s sensitive to the context as you have suggested that would lead you to save Mother Theresa in some contexts and in other contexts the pattern of decision would be different. Mm -hmm. So I don't, well, I don't know if it's actually utilitarianism. I mean, it seems to me you could argue, you could call it pre, you know, a particularism or something. But I always yes. thought particularism was really a new way of packaging Aristotelianism, you know, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, the, it's the point the need to make intuitive reactions in particular situations. And obviously there are dangers with particularism. And of course, you know, you can't you couldn't explicitly use a particularist ethic as a basis for arguing for certain general policies. Because, but because, but that's part of the insight that I think we have to carry around with us. It's like, well, years ago, say when I read Robert Wolf's stuff on uh, philosophical anarchism, and a lot of people find that they get very confused because the way in which we think about practical questions needs changing. We think like most of the time, the decisions that face you and me are what sort of a society should we have? But in actual fact, we only that's about our ideals, and then what we have to think about, we have to distinguish our thinking about our ideals and what we think is progress and what we want to fight for from the pragmatics of our particular situations that will be different as to how we best contribute to that within our particular situations. And um, thinking in terms of, well, if you think that what I should do means what should the government do, for instance, well, no, you're already loading, you're already, you know, you, you can think about what what progress is achievable realistically and how we can campaign for it that's reasonable but um you know it seems to me there's been very convincing arguments that you know, which i wouldn't want to reveal very much in public i would keep them quiet most of the time that you know the whole notion of the legitimate state is a construct that ultimately leads to self-contradiction there's actually a very straightforward argument in wolf's defense of anarchism on that now does that mean that we say well do we say do we say that, well no we don't say that in most political debates Right. Um, because some governments are better than others, even if none of them are legitimate in the specific sense that Wolf defines. Um, but nonetheless, um, we bear that in mind when we are talking about law, what laws we'd like to have and so forth. It's you have to think about how is that debate framed? What kind of a debate is it? And we're not saying what laws should there be in some sense as if by us deciding that now that's going to be the law when we walk out of this building. No, it isn't. We have to th distinguish ideal thinking and pragmatic thinking, and they both have a role in our thinking, in our rational thinking about how to live. Right. And so that. You know, so when it comes, should I sit on a particular committee? Maybe it depends on all sorts of interesting contextual matters, right, which I need to bear in mind in each particular case. But give me a generic answer as to what type of patient I should save. That's I'm only going to be able to say something really you know, not very helpful because it will be too generic. Yeah. What, what are you, you were trying to come in? Hello? I can't hear you, Marco. Can other people hear me? Uh, I can't hear, uh, can hear you. But I, I, I was just warned by Ruin that uh, the link of the conference will close in uh, 9 and 30. So we have only <laughs> three minutes. Uh, to close the the, the discussions oh. and uh, 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 actually actually I have to to finish the the, the discussion now because uh, uh, until uh, the link close without the uh, I finish the uh, I make the the last words and so uh, sorry for uh, for that uh, I have to uh, thank uh, a lot for Michael for this presentation. You you presented to us a lot of things to discuss, and and, and this has been only the beginning. Uh, we are of course in a pandemic, in emergence, an emergent crisis. We have to decide several things, but we 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 are creating a a bond with you, and so uh, we invited Michael to come with us uh, in the October again. And we will discuss with him 
uh, with this e same issues again. So we we don't need to close the discussion now, but yeah. to um, discuss uh, the points. And I will send to both to to all of uh, the people that want your presentation. Uh, and now I I have to uh, thank you again, thank Marcelo, and uh, in name of the uh, uh, our graduate program. Uh, to thank all of the participants, uh, we have uh, two weeks of uh, uh, deep discussions, uh, very interesting, all of them uh, different uh, in, in approach, and, and, and we opened the discussion to other issues uh, uh, beyond philosophy, including. And uh, we think that we uh, can uh, make after this uh, meeting, uh, several uh, reflections, and uh, I think this is certainly we will be very productive. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Darley and Alcino that are also with us in this uh, moment. Uh, I uh, I don't think, but Adjuso maybe is all with you now, and uh, the other Mateus, uh, I know Mateus in 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 an essay that helped us. Uh, which one? Uh, Professor Hernan. Hernan. Ah, OK. Thank you, Hernan. And uh, uh, we uh, hope that, uh, well, well, now the link will close in one minute. Uh, so, oh. Michael, if you want to say something more, but uh, thank you. <laughs> well, OK, well, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't manage to answer all of the participants' questions there. I didn't realize it was going to get suddenly cut off because there's more that could be said and yeah i was trying yeah, i was just i mean that was another quote i used to throw out as well as bernard Shaw on the schiller live in your century but don't be its creature something like that isn't it this is the quote that schiller uses now the point is that that very much is at the driving point of what i've been saying here yes of course you've got to be pragmatic but you've also got but not to the sense of, to of letting that particular structure inhabit your brain so it just you know it, it determines the way you see things you've got to be able to step outside of this and see yourself as part of a bigger process so and of course the other classic marks quote we're not the end of history you know it seems to me those are the key things that when we do our jobs and we inform our practical discourses we have to bear them in mind at all times what exactly that means we do is going to differ in different situations so i'm not necessarily disagreeing with specific things that you've proposed you know it just you know but there's a broader answer to that I don't know. Yeah, maybe that makes sense. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it makes right. sense. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all of you, and uh, good night. Nice. All yeah. right. Good night. Then. All right. Good night. Valeu. Está terminando. Valeu. Um grande abraço aí.